Yeah, I think so. No, I want the room. The room might be. The screens are good. Good evening. We're going to get started here. We're uh, a few minutes late, but not too bad. Uh, a little bit of an emptier room than we're expecting, so uh, hopefully a few more people will wander in quickly and not disturb us too much. Uh, I just wanted to uh, welcome everybody tonight to the introduction to WordPress and the start of uh, WordCamp Ottawa 2014. Not going to do a whole lot of big announcements tonight. That's all for uh, Saturday morning. So uh, basically, I'm just going to get started uh, right into the presentation. introduce myself. My name is Jasmine. Uh, my name is Jasmine Vesk. I'm a freelance web specialist and I am one of the co-organizers of this lovely event uh, today and on the weekend as well as the WordPress Ottawa group. Um, and sorry, I can't see the slides very well. That's terrible. Um, so I, I'm a digital marketer consultant and uh, speaker. I also have a background in web and graphic design and helping people share their important ideas and stories online is really what gets me going. So that's why I'm here today, because I like helping people out. Sorry, guys. We just didn't say. All right. Let's try that. Okay. Well, that's all right. I was pretty much done. Sorry. Sure. Um, I'm Rick Radko. I'm also presenting this tonight. Uh, this is actually the first time Jasmine and I have tried to do this together. Yeah. So we're going to have a few uh, <laughs> stumbling pains on this. We've uh, presented together, but not sort of at the same time trying to share a presentation. We thought that would make it a, a little more interesting for you tonight rather than uh, one of us rambling on for hours on end. Um, so as the uh, as on my slide, I'm a uh, software and web developer designer, and I have my own uh, consulting firm, Marcube Design Forge. And basically, I've been doing uh, websites not necessarily as a full time thing, but I'm doing websites since 1996, almost the sort of the start of when they first uh, came out. I've been working with uh, WordPress itself since 2008. I used a couple of other uh, content management systems before that, like uh, Joomla and. Uh, some of the other predecessors, but uh, WordPress has been my thing for the last few years. Uh, together, we uh, are organizers of WordCamp Ottawa last year and this year. We're also organizers for the Ottawa Meetup for the WordPress uh, group. So if you aren't members of the uh, WordPress Meetup, you should probably look at joining that and coming out to uh, get more WordPress information monthly, but certainly this uh, weekend's gonna get you uh, your fill. And uh, as well, we're also starting a training uh, program. And well, uh, if any of you want to talk to us about that afterwards, uh, you're welcome to, to come and drop by. We're looking to try and uh, get some training here locally in Ottawa, which there's been a void for for a couple of years. These slides uh, the, that says they are posted, that's a bit of a lie. They didn't quite get posted today. Uh, they will be posted on SlideShare at that URL. And that URL will be up again at the end of the slide deck, so you don't need to grab it just now necessarily. Now, why am I not talking? There we go. So WordPress is really big. 
Um, anything and, and a new battle is always difficult at first, but you can have confidence and you can do it. Just take small bites and keep chewing. It's really not that bad. Um, it's a very feature-rich uh, software, just like Microsoft Word, OpenOffice, etc. Um, if you have any questions in general, like <laughs> do ask. You can ask, you know, people in the community, the WordPress community, on our Facebook page or at our meetups or other resources online or when you meet other WordPress people. Um, WordPress people are usually very happy to share their knowledge with, uh, with others. And everyone was new at WordPress at one time. It's not like it's been here forever and we've been doing it for 20 years. So everyone's allowed to be new at the beginning. Um, and so this session is not going to be an exhaustive course. Obviously, we can only fit in so much in the three hours that we have. And it's not going to be hands-on. So it might feel a little overwhelming, but it's a good basis to help you get started with WordPress and also to work um, through the workshops and go to the sessions on the weekend. So it's more of a quick primer. We're going to cover stuff quickly. And like I said, you're not going to get an understanding of everything, but it's going to be a really good start. And don't worry if you don't like get it tonight. It's just a basis uh, to help you get started with the world of WordPress. So um, what we're going to be doing is getting you familiar with some of the terminology that we use in WordPress um, so that you have more familiarity with it. And that way, when you are attending the sessions on the weekend particularly, you won't be stumped as to what some of these words mean. You'll already have a decent uh, basis. So we'll be covering terms, features, concepts, and visuals. So the different sections that we're going to be talking about tonight, they're just sort of broken down on the, on the slides. So the first one is WordPress itself, the terminology, and the different versions of WordPress. Um, basically a backgrounder so that we're all on the same page. The second section will start into how to use WordPress. So the tour of the dashboard and the administrative side of using WordPress. The third section is a little bigger and it'll be on posts and pages as well as adding content and how to manage them. Section four is about the settings panel, and we'll take a quick look at some of the general settings. Um, section five, adding and managing menus. Section six, adding and managing widgets. And don't worry if none of these words mean anything to you right now, eh? Because <laughs> we're going to go through that. Um, section seven, where to get help and add-ons for WordPress, because um, there's a lot of help out there. Uh, and uh, section eight is finding, adding, and managing plugins. Section nine is themes and how to select and use them. And then the final section will be a quick review on maintenance and spam. OK, we just had a little note. You probably can't read it uh, quite a little bit dark up here. But the Wi-Fi apparently is working, even though it wasn't supposed to be tonight yet. Um, so there is, uh, if anyone's got a laptop here and wants to connect up, the SSID is the WordCamp Ottawa. And uh, Carlton 2014 is the password. So that's uh, apparently up and working. So we're all here tonight to find out about WordPress. What is WordPress? It's um, the biggest thing to understand about something like WordPress is it's a content management system. It isn't your website. If you're familiar with doing sort of HTML-based uh, web pages with a little bit of CSS attached to construct a website, Everything you build on your website has a page. There's some content page on the server you can go find that represents a page when you see it on the server. It's a page on your website. When you're working with a content management system like WordPress, it's, there is no page concept like that. It's a tool that builds your website. It builds it on the fly. So it's software. It's written in PHP. And it ha runs with a database. And it takes all the information that you've stored using the interfaces we're going to show you a little bit later on this evening takes that information and kind of takes it and puts it together on the fly into a theme, trying to figure out what pieces of content are supposed to be shown depending on what you've requested for a particular page. So in general, nothing on the site is ever one page that you'd ever see anywhere. It's all created out of little bits and pieces that are put together on the fly when someone comes to visit the site. And that's one of the big differentiators between a content management system and the older HTML and CSS sites that some of you may have worked with in the past or may even still be working with. The other key thing about something like a content management system such as WordPress 
and particularly WordPress because it's considered one of the easiest to use, is you don't really need to know uh, a lot of the web code and languages to be able to work with it. If you start to do something really, really sophisticated, you'll see when you get into it, yeah, you have to start digging into the HTML and CSS a little bit in the editor. But at the surface level, when you first start, everything's in the WYSIWYG editor. You get to work with it, and you see what you're getting. You can edit, and you'll, we'll show you that editor a little bit later. And so basically, it really allows users to manage to work with content only and not really worry about building the website itself, worry about, you know, how do I construct a menu? What's the code for that in HTML? And you know, how do I get different menus on different pages? Well, that's all sort of taken care of by the tool. So this is the um, this is the WYSIWYG editor in WordPress. Basically, if you look at the, the section up there at the top, you'll see there's some icons there that are typical of what you'd find on uh, most sort of Word desktop sort of publishing editing type pieces of software. Uh, this is not what you'd normally see in WordPress. For a few of you might be scratching your head looking at this going, well, that doesn't look like what I'm used to for those of you that have looked in it. Uh, this is actually my setup in my, on my personal websites and all the sites I ever develop. I always install it uh, basically set up this way. And there's a plugin I've added to get a little more capability in the editor. It's kind of interesting that the capability is actually there. WordPress has uh, decided that they want to keep everything simple for everybody. And they've basically taken out a lot of the functionality that's in the editor. The editor is actually TinyMCE is the name of the editor. And it's used in a lot, of, uh, a lot of content management systems as the editor platform. It's actually a separate piece of software. You can actually go look up and you can download it on its own, although it's not going to do you much good without the, the website around it. But it's intended as a website uh, editor built into these kinds of systems. And uh, so what I've done with the plugin that I have is I've put the full functionality of the editor back in place. And I find that unless you're uh, just building a plain, simple blog, you kind of want this functionality. A plain, simple text blog, yeah, you can get away with the default uh, editor and the default commands. If you want to get into tables and advanced structures and things like that, you want to bring the rest of this stuff back. It helps you with it a lot. So there's a question at the back. Uh, well, it'll be coming up later quite uh, heavily, but it's called Tiny MCE Advanced, and it's actually got a couple competitors in the WordPress repository as well. Uh, Tiny MCE Advanced is the one I happen to like to use. So, WordPress we're trying to show is really, really easy to use, and that editor should be something you can see that's going to make it easy to use. So, a little bit about the background about WordPress. Uh, the first version was released in May, uh, on May 27, 2003, so we just celebrated last year uh, WordPress's 10th anniversary, and yes, there was a party. Um, actually, almost all the WordPress groups all around the world had a little shindig to celebrate. That's the kind of community that we are, so we're celebrating 10 years. It's very popular right now. Um, estimates that it's used uh, on about 21 to 25% of the websites on the internet. Um, millions of sites, that means absolutely millions of sites, over 70 million run on WordPress. So it's not, you know, it's not not popular. And other things that it needs are it needs a web server to run, so it needs PHP and MySQL. And, or, and it can be hosted, obviously, live on the web or on a local server on your PC or laptop. Oh yes, so some examples of websites that run on WordPress, just to give you an idea, are Sony Music, Rolling Stones, Herman Miller Furniture, and Carleton University. Uh, the New York Times, NFL, Katy Perry, Foursquare, US Best Buy stores, and the James Bond 007 uh, movies, um, as well as Time Life, uh, Volkswagen, and Ford. And this is the bond. Oh, it's not? Nope, that oh, it's changed. Yeah, yep. something new. Yeah, this is the, I, I re-updated that snapshot. It's not quite up in the, in the slides that we have here. This is the, the WordPress.org showcase as of yesterday. And uh, it's actually Sony Music that's up there now. Oh, that's cool. So that gives you an idea that there, there's, you know, people like Sony Music, there's some really big players using WordPress. Another good thing to know about WordPress is that it's free. Well, what does that really mean? 
Free as in it's open source. You can do what you want with the code with a few restrictions. Um, you can take the code, you can look at the code, you can rearrange the code, you can rearrange the code and then share it with someone or you can just share the code. Um, that's part of the sort of mentality with open source technology. Um, it's also free as in technically it doesn't cost any money. The software, you can go to wordpress.org and download the software to your computer and use it as you, as you wish. However, it doesn't mean that a website built in WordPress is free. Because of course, um, we need things like web hosting, which costs money, domain name, which costs money, and possibly you might end up using um, premium themes or plugins. And of course, if you get someone to build you your website for you, chances are that won't be free either. But generally speaking, WordPress technology itself is free and open source. So before we can go too far with WordPress, one of the things, sorry, question back? Uh, to where to get domain names and hosting and stuff? No, we're not covering that one at all tonight. That would be another day. I know there's a couple of talks, actually there's a talk specifically on hosting on Saturday if you're here for the weekend presentation. Um, and uh, there should be a lot of things covered over the weekend on it. So there's really three different versions of WordPress. Uh, a lot of people might be familiar with, and things like the Sony website we just showed are actually on uh, WordPress.com, which is a service run by a company called Automatic, which is the company that's backing WordPress. It's, it's the, the owner of Automatic is one of the founders, one of the founding creators of WordPress. And so that company has a service where you can sign up to get a website on their systems and you get, uh, basically it's, it's really still aimed at blogs, although their VIP service that's running something like Sony is doing a little more than blogs, but you still largely, as the free service, you're signing up for what's still really sort of targeted as a blog. Um, that is often referred to as the .com version of WordPress when you're talking to people, because it's WordPress.com, so it's referred to it as the .com. A so, little bit of point of clarification that's come up sometimes in presentations in the past is, yeah, the fact that it's got the .com domain for WordPress has absolutely nothing to do with your choice of domains. It doesn't impact whether you're on a .com domain or not. Then there's two other versions of WordPress that are available on the .org site, which is where we, uh, we were showing a few slides back. They're available for download. You have the, and basically it's the, you get the one version for download. It really only is one version. The second version is kind of hidden in it, and you have to know how to turn it on. So there's the regular version, which is what most people use when they download the, the WordPress software from WordPress.org. And then if you know how to do it, you can enable what's known as network or multi-site versions of, of WordPress. And that version of WordPress is um, something that basically allows you to do what WordPress.com is. It allows you to set up a, a, a group of, of blog sites or any sort of site on one install of WordPress. It's probably not something you're really going to undertake on your own. But there are some purposes for it. One of the places where I commonly use it is uh, for setting up multilingual sites. And I'll set it up as a multi-site, one when then you set up one site for each language. And it works quite nicely that way. And there's a few other purposes for it that people are finding to use it for. But it's not something that uh, is commonly used by most people. But you do need to be aware of the three different versions because there are differences between all three. Some things are exactly the same, but some things are quite different. Uh, the things that are quite different are fairly uh, small in number, but it is important to be aware of the fact that, that there are these three different versions. Can you talk about WordPress.com? So let's talk about WordPress.com for a little bit. It's a service. They provide WordPress and the web hosting needed to run it. So it's free for a basic site. And uh, however, that being said, your free version of WordPress on WordPress.com is restricted um, in some ways. The first one being the URL is something like uh, mywebsite.wordpress.com or some name.wordpress.com. So you're going to have that WordPress.com as part of your URL unless you pay um, for a little, they have a premium service where they'll let you use your own domain, your own domain name. There are other limitations that come with WordPress.com. 
your theme and plugin choices, you only have so much to choose from within what they allow you to, uh, to use, and you're not allowed to actually customize it with additional plugins that are outside of what they install for you. Um, also, certain settings you're unable to change, and you can't really change the CSS or the theme's styling that much on the .com. It's really meant for people to sort of run a light, light <laughs> blog or, or, or website that doesn't require a lot of customization and doesn't require the person to own, like, own their own hosting. It's a really good place to get started if you're not sure and you just want to start a blog. That's how I started when I was learning web design. I just got a WordPress.com site just to see what it was like, but I learned very quickly that it didn't offer the customization that I wanted, so I moved to .org rather quickly. But some people love it, and they'll stay there for as long as they have their blog. Yeah, the, the strength of WordPress.com is that it's there as a package. You get what you get. It's maintained. It's serviced, and everything's there, backed up. You, you, you just get in, and you get it, and you're done. You don't have to worry about managing WordPress at all. If you switch to... Uh, WordPress.org, downloading one of your own, your own copy of the software, you now do have to worry about those things like where are you going to get hosting, maintaining the software, keeping it up to date, uh, worrying about security issues. So that's kind of the downside of doing it yourself. The, uh, the upside of doing it yourself is that you basically don't have any limitations with the software. You can do whatever you want with it. Uh, you can add your own plugins, add your own themes, which there's thousands of both to choose from, probably actually even to the tens of thousands now. And so you, sky's the limit. You can do whatever you want with it. So if you've got a business site and you're very particular about how it looks and you want to customize the theme and the colors and the logo and the identity and everything, you're going to be able to do it on the, on the uh, .org download. Whereas something you won't be able to do on .com unless you start paying a lot of dollars for the add-ons or for the VIP service, for instance, like the, the shots that we showed you with Sony. That I mean, certainly was a fully custom site but you're into uh, a lot of dollars for something like that. Uh, the other one, I guess the other note we got on here that I hadn't mentioned is the um, using it, doing it yourself, you are going to need some knowledge, right? You're going to be downloading the software and more than just learning to use the software, uh, if you download your own copy and try to set up your own copy on your own server, you have to figure out how to do the installs, how to manage your plugins and add them and things like that. So you certainly got to be a little bit more comfortable with uh, computing platforms. Go ahead. Well, yes. <laughs> um, you could do it either way. I mean, there are still people that run servers in their basements, so I think they're getting rarer because it's just so cheap to go out and buy something and just rent some space or lease some space, so to speak, on a, on a server. But yeah, anything in there. You're either doing it completely yourself, running your own server completely, but even if you go out and buy public or, or lease public hosting, you've got to install the software, manage it, manage the updates, uh, learn how to, to use it, and more often than not, every once in a while, you're going to have to figure out how to fix things when something goes wrong, because they occasionally do. Updates will go wrong, and you'll break your site, and you have to you know, restore from backups and things. Everybody's got backups, right? That's the, the big one that uh, a lot of people don't. So, I mean, it's, it, it happens, right? Things go wrong when you're trying to run, even on the, on the, the where, even when you're not actually managing the server, server hardware itself, there's still a lot to manage on the site when you're doing it yourself. I think we've kind of already covered and hit on some of this. Uh, just sort of mentioning a few of the things that you can add in the way of plugins and things. Basically, you can take WordPress. I already sort of mentioned I do multilingual sites quite commonly, so there's plugins for that. You can, there's, a, there's a whole social plugin uh, called BuddyPress, which will, for lack of a better thing to call, it's not quite the same, for lack of a better thing to call, it'll turn WordPress into a Facebook site. So you create your own Facebook, kind of. It's got a lot of similarities. There's plugins that will uh, allow you to connect to the social media networks, like Twitter, Facebook, Google. Uh, you can do integration that's bi-directional. You can have stuff that's posted on those sites come into your WordPress site. You can have stuff that's posted on your WordPress site go to those sites. So there's all kinds of integration and links you can do there. You can add forums. BB Press is another one uh, created by the WordPress family of companies. Actually, it's turned into a plugin now. It used to be a separate uh, uh, piece of software. And uh, there's wikis and things too you can add to WordPress. So basically, again, as we sort of already said, 
sky's the limit. There's thousands of plugins and things you can add to customize to, uh, to WordPress. There is some cost for some of these. I haven't seen too many plugins that exceed the $150 a year ballpark. There's a couple of really, really big ones that do that. They might get up in the 200 for like a developer license that that's, allows you to do what you want with it and put it on lots of sites. Most of the plugins and themes are currently that I've seen are in the $30 to $80 a year ballpark, which if you're putting a business on a website should really be a significant cost. And it really makes your life a lot easier just to go and grab one of those ready done. <coughs> All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about how to some of the customiz customization that you can do with WordPress.org. Uh, so setting up WordPress and installing the themes and plugins is relatively easy. It's obviously going to be a little difficult or not even difficult, but uh, scary at first just because you've never done it before, just like anything the first time that you do it. Um, and if you've never, ever made a website before, that you're going to have a bit of a learning curve. But it's basically fairly simple. So you can get a WordPress uh, website from zero to something on the web in a few hours with a little bit of knowledge. However, customizing WordPress or themes or plugins may require extensive knowledge. It really depends on what it is that you're trying to do and how familiar you, familiar you are with WordPress itself as well as some coding. Eventually, depending on what you're trying to do, you might actually decide to hire an expert. Um, and, However, there's a lot of resources to help you along. Um, WordPress.org has their own we call it the codex. It's basically all of the documentation that you could possibly think of to do anything with WordPress from how do I install it to what are the different user roles to how do I change my header it, to far more complex things that we won't discuss today. Um, it also has a forum and sometimes someone might have had the exact same question as you already posted on the forum and someone's already helped them out. So those are two really good places to check for answers first. Um, especially for the, the install of WordPress it's pretty good. They explain how to install it, so it's a good place to start. Well, and there's WordPress's famous five-minute install, as yeah, they advertise it. I almost it. called it that, but it's not really five minutes. I think I can do it in five minutes now, but it was definitely not five minutes the first time, maybe even the third time. <laughs> um, there is, oh yeah, however, just because there is a lot of documentation doesn't mean it's always 100% right. So if you ever do have a question uh, or you try something and it didn't work, there are other resources you can check online, or you can always you know, ask one of your WordPress friends. Um, there are other resources, like I said, online. So you can do the typical Google search. Like most things, if you're looking up information online for technology-related things, check the date. Because if you're looking at something that was posted in 2011, WordPress has had many, many iterations uh, since then, because it does get updated regularly. So the information may not be accurate. So just something to keep in mind. Same thing with plugins, themes, et cetera. You might be reading something that just is not applicable anymore. Um, and you'll kind of get to know some of the good places to look for, to look for stuff online when you, when you do. So like Smashing Press and, and some of the WP, uh, WP Water Cooler. And you'll just kind of get to know some of the uh, good online resources that have valuable information about WordPress and their you know, blog posts and tutorials, and they're all free, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, another place to look for information, obviously, is the WordPress meetups. Like Rick said, we have a local group that's actually very, it's thriving. We have almost 600 members, and we have two, uh, two meetups per month, almost every month, except for WordCamp month, when we have WordCamp, which is even better. Uh, so there really is a lot going on in Ottawa. You can get a lot of information at, uh, at the meetups and WordCamps. We have one in Ottawa. There's one in Toronto in November, the 15th and 16th. Montreal hasn't, uh, hasn't said when they're going to do it this year, if they're going to do it. And Vancouver and I think Calgary or Edmonton also have them. And the states have them almost everywhere. Hmm? Oh, and Winnipeg. Oh, yes. So, you know. WordCamps are a great place to go as well. And books, however, books kind of like old internet articles might be out of date by the time that you actually read the book. Uh, so check to see when they're published. But I think you had a digging into WordPress is actually a, a book that 
while it was published a while ago, it still has some valuable information about well, WordPress. Well, actually, it's an ebook, so it's it, oh, they it keep updating updated. it. So yeah. it's later on in the slides too. Oh, okay, I wasn't sure. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> oh, that's a website. That's weird. I thought that was before. Yeah. Oh well. Now we're just talking about the general stuff. So there was one more brief slide on multi-site. I think I'm basically going to skip it. Uh, other than it was once known as WPMU, so you might see some references to that. Uh, and if, if you do see it, that's what they're talking about. It's the old standalone version of multi-site. Uh, tonight, we're really talking about trying to get you using WordPress. And, and well, not even really using it, just trying to get you familiar with the terms and the concepts of WordPress. So that when you come uh, to the weekend, to Saturday and Sunday for the main presentations, you aren't drowning in new terms and stuff that you don't understand at all and so that everything isn't going over your head. Because most of the presentations, while they, uh, well, there's a whole bunch of them that are quite basic or at the beginner level, they are going to be talking using the terms, expecting you to have some familiarity with them. So that was the idea. Really what we're trying to do is get you familiar with stuff tonight. So we really don't have time to go into the installs. As Jasmine already mentioned, there's a lot of help online. Uh, there's a link there that takes you to the main page for installing WordPress. And uh, basically, that's where I'm going to leave that part of it. Uh, this presentation, one other little note, is basically based on doing things as a .org install, as, as you download yourself. A lot of what we talk about, you won't be able to do on a .com site. Some of the basics around content you will be able to, but any of the more advanced features you won't be able to do on the .com, so, uh, yeah, on WordPress.com. Sorry? Uh, again, as I sort of mentioned earlier, the, the WordPress.com is just the concept of that's their service. It's at WordPress.com. It has nothing to do with any domain name you may choose to use. Um, you, and as Jasmine sort of mentioned too, for a fee, you can get rid of their URL and put your own on it, and you could use something.ca on WordPress.com. And most people visiting your site wouldn't know that you're on WordPress.com. You'd have to sort of go digging in the code. Developers can go digging in the code on the website, you can tell. Um, but the average user is not going to know that you're actually running on WordPress.com. But again, that would be something you'd have to pay extra for to get there. If you're on your own, doing your own download from .org, or you've downloaded your own copy of WordPress to your own server, you can do whatever you want in terms of domain names. You know, you could have. Uh, and that's where you see some of them in the spam now. You see some really silly domain names. You know, you could have silly dot this dot name dot some domain dot country dot com. You know, it would be a ridiculous domain, but you could do it. That's just what WordPress has called their help section. Basically, it's really what it amounts to. It's just the name for it. Again, that's kind of why we're here tonight, trying to talk about the terminology. So anything you don't understand, please do ask. Uh, Codex is just their name for their help section. Uh, it's probably short for something, I would guess. Something once upon a time, someone probably decided it's a short form. I have no idea. I haven't seen a definition for it. Um, it's just the Codex. So all you need to know is the Codex is the place that has everything about WordPress. Um, and it's, as I'll mention later, but it might as well, now that we got it here now too, um, it's got everything from user level documentation of how to do things with WordPress in terms of content to the actual uh, documentation on the code APIs and everything in between. Like it is everything on WordPress that there is for an official site on WordPress. Just the document repository. Nothing magic to it. Not just document repository. Uh, good question. Um, so if you've done it through domain hosting, uh -huh. you've got the download. Yeah. Uh, okay. Of, from doc, what's, it is actually the same software, but .com is a service. You can't actually download it. It's actually a service. You sign up to that service. Um, who has Netflix? Right? You sign up for Netflix. You download videos from Netflix. WordPress.com is a service. You buy their service. They provide you hosting. They provide you a place to put your website. So you'd very definitely be going to their interface using the software on their hosting. If you have your own hosting, there's, there are quick click installers to, to actually download WordPress on most hostings, Fantastico and Simple Scripts and things like that. Um, and, they, and that may be what you've done. You've clicked one of those installers that says install WordPress. And it, 
Yes. Yeah, okay. So I'm not too familiar with either of those. I don't use them extensively. Um, they're not two of my more favorite hosting companies. But um, you can, they, they have downloading, they have scripts on them that will load the software for you. So just a click and you load WordPress and it sets it all up for you. So it would be the .org version of the software. Um, in essence, it's all the same software. Like .com is running what's on .org with a few, uh, a few enhancements that they do for their own stuff. But in theory, it is the same software. You're just downloading it for free from .org, or your hosting company will be downloading it for free from .org. Um, do you want to do this one or you want me to do it? All right. So WordPress, uh, basically when you come to a WordPress site, one of the other key things to understand about it is that there's two sides to it. Because it's, it's a dynamic system, you've got to manage it somehow. So somehow there's got to be an admin interface, and somehow there's what the public sees. So there's two interfaces. What's sometimes called the front end is the user interface, the public part of the site, the site that your users see when they come to yourdomain.com or yourdomain.ca. Uh, they see the website. They see the public side of the site or the front end. Uh, this particular theme I was just going to mention is uh, WordPress's latest theme. It's 2014. It was basically targeted as being a magazine theme. So it, right now it's kind of empty. It looks kind of blah because there's nothing in it. Um, but it, it really does show well if you have a lot of image content. You can go see the demos on the WordPress repository. But it, it's targeted basically at media. If you don't have a lot of uh, heavy usage of images, video content and stuff in your site, it's probably a theme that's not going to work very well for you. This is uh, the latest in the th series of WordPress's 20-something themes, I'm going to call them. It's 2014. It started way back uh, with 2010, and we've got everything in between if you go and search them out. Yes, but generally if you go to a hosting company, um, they're running an Apache server or whatever. Like using something like XAMPP, we're kind of segueing in a place we don't really get, we don't have time for it tonight. Um, and actually there are, uh, if you are at all interested in that, there are workshops on the weekend and sessions on the weekend again as well about installing your own server on your own uh, computer. Um, that would be something like XAMPP. Where that comes then, yes, with Apache, MySQL, PHP, usually a few other things all buried into it. When you go and get public hosting at GoDaddy or Bluehost or uh, NetFirms or any of those companies, they provide all that for you. You would just download and install WordPress. Yeah, but that, that's my point. Like, all of that stuff is very different than what you're talking about. So yeah, but you don't even really see it, local, which is why we have, yeah. On a local machine, you've got to worry about it. Yes. Yes, but generally if you go buy hosting, you don't have to think about it. You just install WordPress, you don't have to think about the rest of that stuff, other than configuring the database, but it steps you through it. On well, actually the install scripts that uh, you, probably you have used, um, they generally set up all the databases and everything for you. So at the simplest level, if you go out to public hosting at any of those companies and you use one of their install scripts, they'll generally do everything for you, including setting up all the databases and everything. It's pretty painless at that level. I was just going to add one thing that if you do decide to install WordPress manually yourself by following the famous five minute install, it will actually walk you through making a database and database users. We're just not getting into that conversation totally here because we're just going to help you understand the basics about WordPress as opposed to, uh, as opposed to uh, how to set it up and install it. All right, Greg? Yeah, Greg. Yeah. So. Greg is one of our speakers this weekend, and he's doing nothing but hosting all weekend. So um, he's the man if you want to talk about uh, hosting over the weekend. Sure. It's using an external database. Again, I'm going to have to start trying to push. We're running, starting to run behind the, the questions about hosting and databases and stuff to the side. There'll be lots of opportunity for that on the weekend. but. WordPress needs all that underneath it, but I really just want to try and talk about WordPress tonight. 
So 2013 is one of the other themes that still comes in the current install. Um, this was basically targeted as a blogging theme. And uh, if you start playing with it, you can kind of see it fits that mode a little better than, uh, than some of the other themes. 2012 is a theme that most of the demo tonight or the presentation tonight is going to be on. It also still comes with the latest version of WordPress. And it's basically a general purpose theme that's well suited to uh, building sort of more business sites. It's really, really, really bland. Uh, but that's actually kind of one of the nice things about it for the people that like to use it. Because it's so bland, it's actually easy to start dressing it up and doing things with it. I've got sites that look absolutely nothing like what you're seeing in front of you, and they're basically running on 2012, but heavily customized versions of 2012. Um, basically, to customize something like that, you would add a child theme underneath it, which is sort of the way to get around actually modifying the main theme. And child themes, again, something that would be a whole course on itself, um, probably a whole day course. We'll probably be running one of those in the near future. We ran one at the meetup. We had a whole day on theming last fall. And it is literally a whole day just to try and get across, even actually a light dusting. But you know, if you want to do some quick changes, it really isn't that hard. A couple hours, and you could be up and building your own child themes, making quick, light changes to a theme. And we have two presentations. We have, two, uh, yes. we have a presentation on Saturday about child themes, and we have a workshop on Sunday about child themes. So if you're interested in how to customize your WordPress website using the best practice of creating a child theme, we've got you covered on the weekend. I have to mention those, yes. Got to get those plugs in there for all the presentations. Um, part of the point of showing these three themes as well was, as you can see between the regression here, all I've changed is the theme. A couple of clicks, literally a couple of clicks in the admin interface changing the theme. Site looks radically different, right? That's just changing the theme. All right. I'll cover this one while I'm here then, and then you can keep going. So the second part of the site is the back end. So the opposite to the front end is our back end or the dashboard. And this is where you do all the management of your website. You add content, change the settings, uh, add plugins, add themes, change the themes. This is usually a private part of the website. It's password protected. This view is what you'd normally see for the dashboard in the current versions of WordPress. Uh, this is where you uh, would come to when you log in. This is the default login point. How do we get there? There's a login screen, which um, it, you, some sites you're going to have to know that you've got to type the wp-login.php afterwards. Some sites will have the, uh, there's a meta widget that's got, a, that's got links that sometimes you'll have in your sidebars. Um, very few business sites actually keep that widget. You usually kind of get rid of it pretty quickly. Uh, so you need to know where the link is or bookmark it, and you can log in, get the login screen. There is also a password option. If you forget your password at the bottom, you can email yourself a password, something that tends to get used a lot, I find. Okay. Um, did you look at these ones? Go ahead. Go. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the dashboard. Uh, after logging in, you arrive at the dashboard. And that's what the dashboard now looks like with uh, WordPress 3.9, the newest release. So we see um, the welcome screen and some help links for uh, WordPress, as well as some suggested places to start to work on your site. Um, all of that stuff, though, like in the middle, you can actually hide and get rid of anything that isn't uh, useful for you. I usually just leave it alone, maybe out of... Uh, I, I just know where I'm look, where I need to go to look for things, but you can actually customize this area if there's something specific that you want to see first. And um, I don't know what that means. <laughs> oh yes, the uh, the welcome screen. That was just kind of the point on there. The the welcome screen. A lot of people don't know is that there's a uh, screen options tab up in the corner. And uh, oh, that was supposed to be circled in the slide. That's part of why it's hard to see. <laughs> way up, way up here. I don't know if you. You can all see it. There it now is. It's all right. Up. Oh, you had to click twice. Click, click, yeah, okay. So that uh, screen options tab would actually bring back the welcome screen if you get rid of it. And uh, it's an important option to know about because there's a lot of screen options on a lot of different pages within WordPress, and a lot of people forget about it. Um, even experienced users will often forget about it, that there's some settings hiding up there. 
And the settings change per page. So it depends on what page you're in in the admin in WordPress, you'll get different settings. A lot of times they're similar, but a lot of times some of them are quite different. I think we cut over there anything on there. And that's actually the drop down showing me the options that you could redisplay the display page, uh, or sorry, that welcome page that was on the front screen. And similarly, I'm going to kind of breeze through a few of these. We're starting to run way behind because of our, our little talks. Um, although somewhat we've covered a lot on later slides, so we'll probably just skip some later slides. Uh, another item worth knowing about is the help tab, basically in the same spot as that uh, screen options. And it has context sensitive help. And this is kind of one of the drop downs you get for the help. And it has sections with links that go back to WordPress as well as uh, help that's particular to that page on the site. And developers of plugins and themes, not that a lot of them do, but they can actually add uh, help in these sections as well. So sometimes it's worth checking it out the first time you're going through some of your stuff on the site. There, do you want to do the nav section? Sure. So you'll notice on the left-hand side of your uh, login is the main navigation. And that's where you're going to find all of the WordPress features and settings and options. And uh, there's a flyout menu on the hover, as you can see. So, you know, what, I think that one is, is it posts? Yeah, so add new, um, categories, tags, uh, all posts. So you'll, you'll get that uh, more options when you hover over the initial option. So that's where pretty much all your content is going to be on that left side. So you know to go look for things there. So the toolbar runs at the top, and it's context sensitive. So um, some of the stuff, I think, we covered. So the, there's a WordPress help. There's a quick switch update notice. Uh, if you have an update, whether WordPress needs to be updated or themes or plugins, because those are things that do need to get updated. You'll see a little, uh, is there one there right now? Yeah, you'll see a little circle that tells you something needs to be updated. Go check it out. Um, Comments that need approval also will show up there, as well as uh, creating new content. And on the other corner, so the right corner, you'll actually see your profile or whoever's logged in. If you're looking, if you're logged in, you're going to see your profile um, as well and your settings as a user, as well as an option to log out. I don't think I need to miss anything. No, I was no. just going to say that probably the only one that I use anything with any regularity in that is the switch back and forth between the front and the back. The rest of them, I don't tend to use that much. I don't know yeah. why, but. <laughs> oh yeah, so that same toolbar, almost exactly, will also show up when you're on the front, uh, front end of your website. So if you're logged in to your website and then you go to actually look at it, like what the user would see, you're actually gonna see that bar still there because you're logged in. It's gonna give you some additional things. So you could be on a page and directly edit the page or skip to create a new post or add a new image or something right away. However, it only shows if you're logged in. So don't ever, don't ever worry and think, oh, why, why are my users gonna see this? They're not gonna see it, only you're gonna see it when you're logged in. All right, so now we're going to talk about content, which is awesome because the whole point of having your website is to put stuff in it so that people can go look at it. So basic content holders in WordPress are posts and pages. Um, and they're pretty much the same thing. Almost all page, uh, sorry, every page is actually a post. So we'll kind of, get, we won't get into that in great detail, but you'll understand that these are the two basic ways that you can share, uh, that you can display information on, on the site. Technically almost everything in WordPress Well, everything is, is technically a post, yeah. So, Even menu items. Yeah, and definitely images and things like that. So basically, posts are individual pieces of, of content. They're usually used for blogs or maybe news, something where it's uh, aggregated content, usually in re reverse chronological order. So if you think about a, a blog, you go to the blog, you'll see the latest blog post, maybe with the title and a little bit of information, and then the following blog post that was made before and then before and then before and then before as we go down the line. Alternatively, it can be entire articles in their, com in their uh, entirety. <laughs> I guess that's redundant. Um, they're associated with the date and 
that's what I mean when I say reverse chronological order. That's usually how they display, and they're associated with the, the date that they were published on. And oftentimes, that information is actually in the URL. Um, posts aren't usually in the actual navigation menu of a website. That's not generally how they're displayed. And in the RRS feeds, if your website uses them, that's what's going to show up there, is all of your posts. Posts also have categories and tags, so they can be, um, you can divide them or categorize them in ways that are going to make sense for your user. I think on the weekend, there might be a session that talks more about, uh, they call that information architecture, how to decide the categories and tags that your posts uh, are going to have. Um, but generally speaking, you don't want too many of either, so just a FYI. Um, and like I said, they're descriptive elements about your, your posts. Another thing that can be on your posts is a sidebar. So imagine you have a website where your main information is on the left side of the screen and then you have all these little things on the right hand side. That would be your sidebar and where your widgets live. And we will talk about widgets so you don't need to know what it is right now. <laughs> I think that the biggest difference, uh, the one point I'd like to add to that for the, for the posts is, again, it comes back to the idea of this being a content management system. Your posts are generally not displayed as a single, like you can get to a single post, but a lot of the power of posts is they are displayed as collections of posts. Like you can, you can display them by date, in different date orders. You can display different periods. You can actually go in and do a month or a year or a day. Um, you can, you can tag them, as we mentioned, by the categories mm -hmm. and, the, and the tags or the default um, uh, metadata that you can attach to uh, posts in, by default in WordPress. And you can choose things based on those tags. So you could have a category in your, uh, your blog posts of, you know, oh, maybe it was sunny days. And so you can see all the posts that talk about sunny days and anything like that. Literally anything you want to tag the posts with you can start having uh, indexes into the posts on that piece of data. I think we covered everything on that one that's critical. Actually, this is kind of what Jasmine was talking about with the sidebar. Um, and as well, if you look along different sections, I'm just going to grab my pointer again. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at the different, uh, the different sections on there, so we've got the sidebar, which has all the widgets and things on it. So basically, you get different links and indexes into the content. Part of the post structure, although this is theme dependent, um, it starts showing things like the category it was in, the tag that was assigned to it. Uh, you'll get a publishing date, potentially. And on a general sort of display of posts, you often wind up with multiple posts. You can get to the single if you want, but you often wind up with multiples when you first start looking at them. One of the other things to point out again, uh, Jasmine touched on it in the, in the toolbar at the top. There's also sometimes in some themes, you'll have an edit link that is available on the, uh, on the content. Again, that link is only there if you're logged in. Your visitors that aren't logged into your site don't see it and don't get to edit your content. But it's a question that I often have people coming to me in panic. It's like, there's an edit link. People can edit my content. And it's like, no, only you can, only when you're logged in. Again, this is just showing a different view of things. Uh, another display. And we got uh, the single display here, which actually shows you the content boxes down, uh, the comment box down at the bottom that you'd actually enter. So this is if you clicked on, actually turns out the uh, titles on those posts on the previous page, the blue part is actually an active link. And it takes you then to the, to the single post on, uh, on the WordPress site. So in contrast to posts, we have pages, which you're already very familiar with. They're standard static content blocks. Usually things for like your about page or maybe your services page or definitely the contact us page. Um, so you've all seen them before. And they're usually the actual pages that are in the site menus. When you go to see a site and you've got the navigation, usually those items about contact, services, portfolio, whatever the case may be, are in that navigation. So those page, uh, those, that content, unlike posts, are pages. They, um, 
don't use tags or categories. That's one of the things that makes them different. And they're also not tied to a date. So for example, the URL would be domain name.com page title. So whatever your domain is. So like for me, it's like jasminevest.com forward slash contact me, something like that. So it's a easy to remember uh, URL. And some menu items might seem like pages, but they're actually dynamic post archives usually. So you could potentially have a website or a blog where let's say you've categorized all of your posts about travel with the category travel. And you want all of those posts to show up in your navigation. Um, sorry, not in your navigation, but you want, well basically, you want there to be a travel link on your navigation. And when you click on that travel link, it's going to take you to all of the posts about travel. So just a little thing, it might look like a page, but if it's generating dynamic content like that, it's actually posts. Just a little, kind of a little different thing. So this is the page, uh, the page display. It looks kind of similar to the post, uh, uh, the single post display because it's just showing that static information, your title, your content. Um, if you have that sidebar element, you're going to see your sidebar with, ever, with whatever sorry, chosen widgets you have. Um, that's going to be dependent on your theme. And there are no, like I said, no dates, no categories, no tags, information. And it can or cannot, you can choose to toggle this on and off, uh, a comments section. But you don't need to have it. Well, and again, some of that's theme dependent too. Some no, didn't true. have it by default. That's right? true. That's true. Oh, right. So this is now we're going to show you, I know it's not a workshop, so you'll have to bear with us with the slides, but basically we're just going to show you how easy it is, because really it's easy to create a post or page yourself. So as we remember, the dashboard is where we get all the cool things that we need to do to make our website. So the posts menu, we hover over it, and we can create a new post from there. So that's the post editing screen. As you can see, um, like we mentioned before, WordPress is great because it uses a WYSIWYG, so what you see is what you get. So already you realize that bar at the top is where you would enter, or not a bar, but that space at the top is where you'd enter a title. And then the uh, larger box below it is where you would add your main content. And you also have your, your options to make things bold or, or have a heading or things like that. So you do have some uh, formatting, just like you would if you were using a a text editor or like a, a word, edit, uh, like word or something like that. And that's why, and then sorry, to the right, you'll see that blue button that's so fantastic and you just click publish. Boom. Now your information is living on the internet. And that's why people love WordPress because it's really that easy. It's plug your content in, press publish, it shows up. You didn't need brain surgery or know how to do any code to make it happen. Um, and yeah, sure. So basically there was a comment here I was going to talk about just trying to, again, describe how easy it was to get. And because I built the demo sites that these pictures are taken of. To get here, I installed WordPress, selected the 2012 theme, which was literally a couple of mouse clicks, um, and then created that post. So for me, having installed WordPress a few hundred times or more, I could get here in about seven minutes. I'd have this page of content, brand new site, up and running. Uh, first time through it, you're probably going to take a couple hours. That's quite normal. Don't despair when it takes you a couple hours the first time through to get to here. But once you've done it a few times, it literally, like, especially once the site's installed, of that couple of hours, an hour and a half is going to be installing the site the first time you do it. And then it'll take you 10 minutes to create your first post. I mean, it really is that one, two, three. That's it. It really is that easy to create a post, which we then have up on the site. Want to go through the rest of the posts? Oh. Ah, okay. Part of, sort of, some of what we're doing tonight, as I said, this is the first time we both try to do this together. And then on top of that, not to help anything, our original slide decks we're working from were two years old, and they really did not look like this. Uh, WordPress 3.9, which came out a couple weeks ago, has visually changed a number of things. So some of it we can't really see. We're not familiar with the slides anymore. Um, and actually, I can't even see them from here, so I'm going to have to go off the screen. So you can add a bunch of things to your post. Uh, basically, this is just showing the, the category widgets that were on the side before. 
and a tag widget. If you look back, if I can get back to the editor quickly, uh, it doesn't really, sh no, you can't see it. They're off the screen down too low on the editors we were showing there. There's more boxes down the one side column. These are those boxes from that side column where you'd add categories and add tags uh, to the post. And you can see how they come out at the bottom of the post there. It chose terribly creative names, but hey, it's a demo site. Ah, an excellent question, which I don't actually think we've got covered in here tonight because we dropped it out. This, as I said, is kind of a really quick synopsis of a fuller course that takes almost a whole day. Um, categories, uh, do you have a good definition? I don't remember a good definition. Shanta, Shanta, Shanta does because she's an expert too. Go ahead, Shanta. A quick definition let's try here. Categories tend to be things that... Um, They're like an overarching sense. Yeah, more of a, a, almost like a bucket you'd throw things yeah. in. Um, actually, one example I've used, I mean, of course, every metaphor has problems, but say, for instance, you're doing a site on cars. Good categories would be, say, sports cars, vans, and uh, sedans, and, and uh, I don't know what else. So, but tags would be blue, pink. V6. They're things that could apply to any of the cars that are in all the categories. Um, so it's kind of it gives you. Does that give you a rough feel for? Yes. You can have more than one category. And actually, actually, one of the other subtle difference: you can have more than one category of of. You can have more than one category and more than one tag on any post. Uh, one of the major differences is categories are hierarchical. Not that most people use them that way. And tags are just one flat tag set. Um, so you could then. Again, going back to our car site, you could have, you know, European cars, and in that you could have sports cars and vans and whatever, and the North American cars, sports cars and vans, although that does start to break down, unfortunately, because the way, um, I don't want to get technical here, but just the way WordPress does their, uh, way it's actually coded and structured, you would actually start running into a bit of a problem trying to do that with the duplicate categories. It doesn't actually kind of like the duplicate categories. Yeah, you could do that. Except the categories aren't really well, only for yeah, by default. Yeah, yeah. yeah basically, at the, by, in the default WordPress install, categories and tags are for posts and not for pages at all. Like everything else, because we already said you can do anything you want, you can change that. But by default, it's just the posts. Fundamentally, under the hood, yes, everything is a post. I don't want to get down that avenue and confuse everybody, but thing. But, uh, but fundamentally, basically, there's one main table that has most. I mean, there's a few exceptions and some other pieces, but basically, almost everything content-wise is going into the posts table. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, sort of. I mean, to some degree, tags and categories as well are what you want to make of them. I mean, you can do whatever you want with them. I mean, they have kind of. If you go and research, do a quick Google on tags and categories in WordPress, you'll read some definitions and people tell you what you should and shouldn't do and what you absolutely must follow and all the rules. But to be honest, you, you can use them however you want to a large degree. Uh, again, okay, I'll run through that one. The, the, um, you can change, there's a lot of nifty things. This is where you get into what's really the power of a content management system. Again, these were up on the sidebars on that editing screen, and they're basically the same for, uh, for posts and pages in this case. You can change the status of a post or a page, whether it's published, whether it's in draft, whether it's waiting for review. Um, there's, you can change the visibility of a post. You can make them password protected. Um, you can make them uh, public or not public. There's ways of putting them in separate private spaces. You can also, and this is one that's magic. We use this extensively on the on the uh, on the WordCamp site. If you've been visiting it, all those posts you'll notice some of them appear at 12:01 uh, in the morning. I can assure you that uh, well, some of us are up at 12:01 working on stuff, but we weren't publishing documents at 12:01. That was done by publishing in the future. So you can actually create a future date on something that you want to publish, and it will publish sometime in the future. So another cool thing, aside from things like having something come out on a particular date and not having to worry about it. Like, for instance, the one that we did, all our uh, speaker spotlights. 
those were all scheduled weeks in advance. They just went through and they rattled out. We didn't have to worry about being there every day and scheduling two of them a day. It was just done way in advance. Um, if you're a blogger and you're blogging every day and then you want to go on holidays in Tahiti and wherever you're going in Tahiti doesn't have internet connection, well, you could publish your week's posts in advance and have them all published, set to go one a day while you're away and they'll magically appear and everybody will think you're still there. Um, we can also add uh, image content. Um, actually, I better do this one because, again, this is back to the 3.9 stuff and some of this has changed. Brand new slides today and it's all uh, great new stuff. Uh, 3.9, there's actually still the button there to add images and video content and things, the media uploader. Uh, the button actually is, I don't even read, I don't know what it says. Add media, yeah. It shows you how, like, I just use it, I just click the button, I don't know what they say. Um, so add media, that starts up the media uploader. What's really cool in 3.9 is you can actually just grab an image from your desktop, drag it onto the editing window, and it starts that uploader for you. You don't even need to click the button anymore. This is the uploader that you'll get if you actually click on the button. And then you just do this. Now you just drag the file onto this instead of the editor. So this is the page you'd get to if you either dragged it onto the editor or clicked the button and took the extra second step in there. So this um, lets you then actually insert the media into your page. There's a bunch of options down the side. I'm um, going to quickly gloss over them to catch up a bit of time here. Basically, you just have to be aware of which image you have to be selected. That's the first, that's the first, when they first created this, um, this uploader, it's been around for a few versions. The neat, cool thing of being able to drag onto the editor that's new in 3.9 is I found I was confused by first what I was actually editing in images because it actually shows you as well um, in some modes all the images that are in your library, not, the one, not just the one you just tried to upload to that page. So the blue box around there is showing you the image you're actually working with at the moment. And that's an important thing to keep in mind, uh, is that that's the one you're editing all the details on the side. And that uh, sometimes causes people trouble. I know it confused me at first trying to figure it out. Basically, with that section then, you can change your alt tags, you can change your title, you can add captions. Uh, there's linking capabilities. You can make the picture link to different places, including a bigger version of itself but you can add a link to anywhere you want, and that's all in those options there. When you hit the Add Media down there, you're actually going to get the photo in the post. So we've now added that photo into the uh, little post we were working on there. Yeah, okay. So this is uh, video. WordPress has made it really, really, really easy to add, word, to add video if you like the way it comes out in default uh, based on what your theme does, based on the WordPress set settings. Basically, you can just go to a place like YouTube and numerous other video um, servers as well, but YouTube's the example we'll use. Grab the share link, just the HTML link is all you need. Drop it in the page and you get a video. Now the one thing to note, I'm going to flip back here for a second for this page. When you're doing editing, this can be a bit disturbing because all you ever see in this way of doing it is that link. You don't see any sort of visual representation of the fact that's a video. So if you are trying to do some content layout that's space, space dependent and you're worried about your layout and stuff, that may not work for you that well. But it's really cool, really simple if all you want to do is drop that video in there and have it appear by default. Uh, down the bottom is one that I did by embedding. I took the actual embed code from, your, from uh, YouTube, which has the iframes and all the nasty little HTML and all kinds of other stuff in there you kind of got to understand. And that's how I created the smaller version of the same video there down at the bottom. Because when you use the embed code, you can then start defining the sizes and particular characteristics unique to that uh, uh, provider of video. Because there's a whole bunch of parameters that go to the video provider. How do you do that? Do you want to talk about the next view? Sure. So uh, the images that we were showing you before basically just showed you the visual editor, the visual component of what it looks like when you're editing your content on a poster page in WordPress. However, there's actually a second way to look at your information, which is called text view. So you'll see the top circle on the right, you have visual and text. If you click on the text view, that's the other version. And it allows you to um, see any of the HTML code that is rendering 
uh, because you've created a link or in this uh, example you've created uh, or you want to have a video so the video has to display in H or has to be written in HTML so you can use the text editor to actually change the HTML uh, specifically like if let's say you're making a link and you realize you made a typo or something and you didn't feel like going through the steps to do it again you could just click on the text and fix your typo because it's it's right there. Um, sometimes you just need to use the text editor to get things just just right um, because sometimes it doesn't render the way exactly you expect it to in the WYSIWYG editor. I don't know what you've got at yep. the bottom there. Oh, the bottom, the bottom is just the, uh, the embed code. Oh, right. So it's just I showing the it. actual uh, YouTube embed code. Something I just thought of while Jasmine was talking that's not actually in our slides as a frustration that people often see with the uh, text editor, which by the way, if you're looking at older content, it did actually used to be called the HTML tab. They just changed that in the last year to text. So you might see references to that. Something I thought of was that uh, WordPress does, um, let's call it clean or sanitize the HTML when it flips back to the WYSIWYG mode. And so sometimes some stuff you enter or do in the text mode will get taken out on you. And that can be frustrating sometimes. So you have to be aware of what things are allowed. And again, that can be overridden and is sometimes dependent on your setup uh, for your particular website. Just something to keep in mind if you do start messing with the HTML. It, it, can, uh, it can change it. Okay. So remember we were talking earlier about uh, some of the formatting tools that you have to uh, format your content in the WYSIWYG editor? That little one that circled on the slide is called the kitchen sink. And it basically shows a, when you toggle it, when you click it, it shows a second row of editing capabilities. So you have uh, more options. And we're basically just showing you so that you know it exists. Depending on your theme or perhaps a plugin that you've uploaded, you might get more than what you see here or less than what you see here. But just be aware that uh, if you can't find something and you've, you're trying to format something, chances are, it's hiding under the kitchen sink. Just to be clear, this is default WordPress. This has, doesn't have any plugins to get that second row. So this is in your oh, yeah. default install. Yeah, 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 for sure. Is that any more? So this is just a quick oh, comment. Yeah. A little, another little hidden feature that a lot of people miss. Uh, down in the very bottom corner, there's a little tab you can grab that allows you to resize the editor. Um, so you can make it bigger or smaller to suit your editing. Uh, whims and the size of your screen, etc. Right. Ah, so now, the uh, actually a good use for that, uh, that now you'll notice in the second row, something that was hidden. An important little tab there. Um, when you try to take, you can create documents or create your web content in Word. A lot of people do in Microsoft Word or OpenOffice or whatever people use on the Mac to do their text editing. Um, but typically, but especially with Microsoft Word, if you try to copy stuff out of it and paste it into the WYSIWYG editor, you get a lot of extra junk along with it. WordPress puts a lot of tagging and stuff in the HTML that it creates when you do that copy and paste. And you don't want that on your website because it will override what your theme's trying to do, or at least confuse and make a mess of things. So there's a new, this is new in this version. They now call it the text mode. It actually works quite nicely. If you click that, it actually, it used to be, a, there used to be a sort of a paste thing that popped up and you dumped it in the paste thing and it, it went in. For those of you who used a little bit older version of Word, Microsoft, uh, sorry, of WordPress. Um, the new text mode's kind of cool. It actually flips into a mode now where everything you paste into the editor while well, you've got that editor uh, in, that ver in that session open, um, it, you just paste it straight into the editor now and it gets rid of all the formatting for you. Works quite nicely, a lot faster than the old pop-up boxes that used to be there. Uh, one thing to point out if you do do that is it is stripping out the formatting. So you will, if you've got complex tables and a lot of fancy different things like bolding and italics and all that stuff laced throughout your page content, you're going to lose it. So if you are going to try and do your, uh, your editing in an off-site editor, beware that you may not want to do too much of your formatting in that off-site editor. Leave the formatting to be done in WordPress once you're getting the content there. No, no, because everything in, everything in WordPress is HTML. 
It's driven from HTML, and the CSS uh, does all your. Yeah, it does. I've only been using the new mode for a week or so because 3.9 is pretty new, but I really like it. I find it a lot better than the old buttons. Yeah, cool idea. Yeah. You probably still don't want to go back though from that Word document back to WordPress. No. I just had another thing to add. I was just going to add too that if you're unfamiliar with sort of like web design, HTML, and CSS, and you're working in Word and you're creating, you know, using a particular font size and a particular font for, let's say, your headings because you really like it, and then you're mystified as to why it doesn't render when you move it into WordPress and click publish, the reason for that is because. Microsoft Word and the internet are two very different things. So what you need is a CSS rule. And if, not to complicate things tonight, but basically you want to make sure that your theme has a CSS rule that says, all of my heading twos are going to look like this. And if you're not sure how to do that or get that information, make sure to ask someone on the weekend at the happiness bar, because, or, or the child theming uh, workshop or session, because that'll be really, really good thing to, to understand. It's not complicated, it's just we're short on time today, but I just wanted to let everybody know that so that you're not stumped as to why things don't render the same in Word as they do on your website. Okay, really quick flash on this slide. This is the page editor, um, almost identical to the post editor, except the things down the side for the options are slightly different because of course you don't have things like tags and categories. So I'm gonna blow that one away. Uh, Celeste, do you wanna do? Yeah, sure. So like we were saying before, on the left side of your uh, dashboard uh, are your menu items. And so for instance, on pages or posts, you can actually go and view all of them. So that's the all posts or all pages. And you'll get this list, like you see here, of all the pages listed by name um, that you've ever written, whether or not they're uh, in draft or published. So long as they exist and aren't trashed, they will, they will live there. Um, if you see a dash in front of the page name, that indicates it's a subpage, so it has a, a parent page uh, above it. Um, and hierarchy, just as an FYI, is not as important as it used to be um, because of how WordPress generates menus, which we will discuss later in this presentation. But it still does show up in permalinks. So for instance, um, if you had a page, do we have an example? Uh, it's in there eventually, but uh, I guess not for, no. All right. Well, that's okay. We have, a, we have a permalink example coming yeah, up. Yeah, just so that you understand the, the difference. Okay. Uh, I don't even know where we are for time. Settings. No, okay. Yeah. We're, so, we're yeah. When do we need to break? Soon. Okay. But we, I don't know where we are in the, uh, in the scheme of things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, so. When you first do your, your uh, WordPress default install, it gives you the option to set the title. Uh, but it doesn't actually usually give you the option to set the tagline. So if you want to go back in and change your title or change the tagline that show up on the, on the front of the site, you need to go into the settings. So do you want to do that one? Or? Sure. So the settings, um, like all those other things, post pages, whatever, you'll find on the left-hand side in that uh, navigation menu. Um, and you'll also see that there's a drop-down of a variety of different settings. So the one that we're talking about on this slide is the general settings. And on, if you click on that, then you'll get that page that you see there on the slide. So you'll be able to change the title of your site, the tagline, um, which, by the way, are really good things to do for for search engines, so make sure to fill that information out because uh, that's how Google's going to, when someone types and looks for you, that's how Google's going to be like, oh, it's this site name and blah, blah, blah about my site. So don't leave it as a default, just another WordPress site. Put something snazzy that's all about you. 
Um, you'll also see uh, what the default role is if people are going to subscribe to your, uh, to your website. Um, if you don't want random registrations, just uncheck the box because you probably don't need it unless you're running some sort of membership site. You also have the option to uh, set the time zone. Uh, select a city, the one closest to where you live. In Ottawa, unfortunately, you're not included, so you're stuck with Montreal or Toronto. I apologize on WordPress's behalf because it's terrible, but that's your choices. Or if you live somewhere else, pick, pick whatever is uh, closest to your city. And um, yeah, there's, there's more settings like date, time, how it renders, um, that kind of stuff. And, but we're going to move ahead and look at some other settings. But you have a question. Uh, because, uh, talk to me afterwards. Well, actually, I'll give it quick because many people might have the same question. Uh, same thing with comments and any of the forms on your website. Just taking them off the page doesn't take them away. The underlying code is still there for WordPress. So if you, and the people who do all the spamming and stuff know the URLs. They know how to, like, this, the engines that do all this spamming and stuff, they don't even actually go to the page. They just know where to submit things. They, and they know the format to submit them in. So they don't actually need the actual form to be visible. So just taking away your comment form or just taking away a subscribe form doesn't get rid of the ability to actually do that. So you've got to do a little more if you really want to shut it down. Um, yeah. Yeah, but that would mean that you can't let anyone subscribe except themselves. You would have to subscribe them. You can do it as an admin, but they can't sign themselves up. Uh, there are plugins and things to help you with, uh, to, to do uh, anti-spam subscribers, let's call them. There, there are plugins around that you can do to do CAPTCHAs and things on your subscribes so that the spam bots and things don't subscribe as easily. Uh, a key note that, and the reason I brought up the thing about the, uh, the time zone is if you use the cities, as Jasmine mentioned, that you get um, the proper settings for DST, which you won't get if you use the UTC time formats, which are also available as choices in the Dropbox. Ah, the permalinks. I'll buzz to the permalinks. So Jasmine was already alluding to the permalinks. Um, they are, permalink is WordPress's name for a URL. So they're the way that WordPress uh, d displays its URLs. A default uh, permalink, although I think this, Steph, do you know, has it changed in 3.9? The default setting for permalinks? Does anyone know? I thought when I was poking around the site I just did this week, because part of it too, because the problem is if you've got a lot of sites out and you go and upgrade them to the latest version, well, it carries forward all the settings, so you don't actually know what's necessarily new. And there was a I did one brand new site this week, and it may have actually not had this as the default anymore, but I'm not positive. Um, the default uh, URL is pretty nasty from a, from a readability point of view. I mean, it's descriptive if you understand what it's saying, but even Google doesn't like them. This, uh, you know, this page ID thing, it's not a, it doesn't really tell you a whole lot about what it is you're trying to see on the website. And child permalink is just a different page ID. No hierarchy, no concept that it's a child of the parent page or anything like that. And posts, well, they're P's instead of page IDs. Well, it doesn't really help you much either unless you happen to know that. So there's a permalink settings page, and uh, basically it's a custom box where you can change the permalinks. Sorry. Uh, I think some of us don't understand what permalinks are. I don't know. It's, it's, it's WordPress's name for the URL. So it's the string that's the URL. So in this case, these would be sort of some default examples of a URL into your WordPress site. Perhaps you'll understand a little bit better if I want to change them in a second in a, in a, little, a little more readable. But that's what you get by default with WordPress, at least by the, mo the older default settings. When you go into the permalink settings, uh, you probably can't read those, unfortunately, because of the color that WordPress uses. It, it actually does show the different examples here. I expect that's not very legible towards the back. Um, that gives you different setting options to give you more readable permalinks, as they call it. But it really is just the URL, the, the name that WordPress uses uh, the, for the, uh, the pages on your site. So if we choose one of the commonly used ones, which is the, uh, the month and the name of a, of a page or a post, actually it's usually a post that these are referring to, we'll get permalinks that look more like this. And again, permalinks is just another name for the URL. 
So now, a sample page, which is one of the pages on the site when you see some of the other screenshots we have, you now have your, doma your domain sample page instead of that ID number. Child pages, you now have, if you've done the hierarchy, you're going to get the parent page name plus the child page name. It shows the hierarchy. Which when we had the default settings, it was just a different page ID. It gave you no clue whatsoever that there was a hierarchy. Posts now actually have the date in them and the name. So something that's a little more descriptive of what's actually happening on the pages on your site than those IDs. Does that make sense? Okay. It doesn't like the ones that are IDs because it's not descriptive. Part of SEO is trying to be descriptive about everything. And so a well uh, SEO site, I don't want to get an SEO tonight, but very, very briefly, a well SEO site is going to have a title that's done well. It's got keywords in the title. Your URL should have some of the keywords in it. Your content should have the keywords in it. So if you go back to having those page IDs, you clearly don't have keywords in your, in your URL. Right? So it's not, it doesn't work as effectively for search. What have we got next? Uh, permalinks. Oh, yeah, quick note on permalinks. Um, if you change your page title, when you, when you create a page title, uh, WordPress automatically creates the permalink or the URL that's being used. If you go and change the page title, it does not change the underlying permalink because the idea is that you've already, it, that is once you've published the page. If it's in draft mode, it'll change it. But once you've published the page, it won't change that underlying permalink. And the reason for that is it's assuming that you've already published that page, people already know where it is, and you don't want the address to suddenly change. So if you do actually want to change the permalink, you can edit them by clicking that edit button. You can actually go in and change it. You can make it match the new title. The easiest way to make it match the new title is just to delete it and hit OK, and WordPress will do all its magic for you. Um, but then beware, if you do go and do that, you probably want to put in place a, a redirection plugin in WordPress, of which there are many, and I'm not going to talk about tonight but that will redirect the old URL to the new one so that people don't lose that page. And hopefully we're getting to a point. Uh, it's 8.30. Let's take a break here. And uh, I can't remember if this was the official break spot or not, but I think it's time for a break. We'll give you uh, 10 minutes. I should give you 8 minutes. I have 8.32, so 8.40, we'll get started again. Your Hi. registration manager for tomorrow. Oh, excellent. Um, not tomorrow. Sa Saturday. I, I signed up for Saturday. Did okay. you still need somebody for Sunday? I thought Are you on Saturday? No, okay. okay. I'm the second person on Saturday. No, that's no, fine. No, that's good. Uh, Saturday is going to be a bigger day, yeah. especially in the morning. So, right now, if I recall the schedule, and I actually changed the schedule a bit. I got fewer volunteers because there's two of you as registration managers. No, no, you're still as a registration manager. But I dumped some of the regular volunteers, so it would mostly be the you and the other registration manager through the day. But with having two of you, you know, especially once we get in the afternoon and wander off the bathroom and you know go to see a session maybe. Yeah, but so I can't see any sessions on Saturday. Did you? Did you were there some you wanted to see? Um, yeah, that was the intent of the registration manager. So if there's some you want to see, talk to me tomorrow and we can maybe shift you around or we'll make sure you're spelled off somehow. No worries. Sunday, Sunday I want to be seen. Sunday? Yeah, okay. So that's good. So yeah, don't do the registration manager on Sunday. Yeah. But yeah, send me an email tomorrow if you want. We can check it out or work on it. I'm fine. I just myself. So okay, perfect. I will be there at 7 o'clock.
actually, I, I was talking to some of the techies. Yeah. 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 I have a laptop before this one, only at HDMI. Right. The modern one is yeah. yeah. I guess they decided four or five years ago this was going to be the new thing, and they were only putting HDMI on. Yeah. Well, yeah. still today, <laughs> most projectors don't yeah. take yeah. HDMI. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's over one of the tech things. It's probably never going to take HDMI. Apparently, in a room like this, yeah. the cable lengths to get from here and around the ceiling and everything up in the projector, yeah. HDMI yeah. doesn't support that much. So, not on boosted and stuff. So, it's very expensive. Whereas VGA does. Yeah. Like, I've got a 50 foot VGA cable just going over here, and that's yeah. the cable I have. Yeah. Yeah. VGA yeah. has no problem with right. 50 feet of cable. Right. Well, plus whatever you're scrolling through. Yeah. 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 A lot of people don't believe that one. I mean, they try. They want to have a backup. They, believe me, they don't want you no, not they, to be backed up, they but they have failed you too. They said, oh, we had, like, we thought we had it, and we realized our files were corrupt, and it's like, are you joking? Yeah. This is, you know, how long do they have to use these computers for now? I mean, yeah. uh, you don't have proper backups? You have incremental backups? Yeah. Yeah. They said, oh, we took a back to your site like six yeah. weeks ago. We haven't taken a look at the end. So they finally got the yeah. 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 yeah, it was totally useless. So yeah. Yeah. there's a lot more of that stuff. Realize though, yeah. because these guys are going through the storage. Anyway, right. So, what I'm wondering, I'm, I'm thinking about now maybe doing is hiring somebody to get a basic site up for me, try to translate it away. One of my sites looks real, they can take a loan to build it and help me maintain it. Like, it's really yeah. This is more just for me. I like to write. Yeah. Um, so, can I post like an artist or something? Honor, honor, meetup group? Like, the Ottawa meetup group? Yeah. Facebook gets, better? Facebook gets better response than them. You can post it to the meetup group yeah, if you want, but Facebook places. gets better response. Because I, I tried to a couple of people online. They wanted a lot of money. I said, look, I, I'm not making any of those. I mean, one of the things I'm just decided I've set up for caregivers for uh, family with mental health problems. Yeah. I, I don't have time to even write this stuff, let alone pay for it. But I'll, I mean, I'll put down some money, but it's, yeah. it's really just me yeah. trying to be nice to others. And well, they're saying, give like me 2000 bucks. Honor, like, Two thousand bucks is peanuts for a website, to be honest. I know that, but I mean, I need yeah. somebody who's going to work with me just to get a little bit done here and there. Yeah. And then, I mean, to go from a free host service like Google Sites that I can put up with nothing, all I really want to do with that one is maybe move it somewhere else and attach my own domain name and pay for the domain name and stuff. So I, I basically want to find somebody to help build yeah. your gear. Yeah, well, post on our Facebook group. That'll be a good idea. Um, yeah. Because uh, we have over 200 members yet. Yeah, I think it has over well, 200 members. Thank you. 
install WordPress, then maybe a plugin in the If it's like bucks, you don't usually get a lot. So the two cheap places give you a little more, but you probably don't want to go there. Lots of people around. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I just uh. Yeah, I'll drop by there and shoot the breeze. I just want to bounce some ideas. I may uh, scale back on what I want to do too for now. I'm just I'm not sure. Anyway, thanks. Take care. You're welcome. All right, I'm going to uh, try and get everything started back up here again because we're actually a little behind schedule still. We're one module short of where we were supposed to be for the break. How long is menus? Uh, sorry? How long is menus? Uh, not very long. Did you want to do yeah, menus? Yeah, menus. Okay. So all this talking is making my voice hoarse. I'll try to go through. Yes, try not to embellish. Yeah. We've been embellishing too much. Okay, so we're going to get started again, everybody, because uh, we don't want to keep you here till all hours of the night, as much as we love you. So we're going to start talking about the next section, which is uh, menus. Um, and menus, just as an FYI, are it's your navigation. We, ju we just, or navigation of some kind, it's called menus in WordPress. So um, there are two ways to create menus. And... Um, Oh right. So in this example, with the with the uh, with the setup that we use, the demo site that we used, the menus on the site were created from the page list. So WordPress takes the hierarchy and order from the page list, um, with home added, your home your home page, uh, to be your to be your start. So you can see that's the drop down menu on the test site. Oh yes, so if we added another page, then another page gets added. So you can see how it's taking its, uh, it's, taking its information on what to put in the menu from the pages you're creating. Oh yeah. <laughs> so ordering menus. Uh, changing the menu order requires numerically ordering the pages at each level. And to change the hierarchy, then you have to change the parent page. And you can do all of this from the page editor, but we're going to show you a much easier way to do this, so don't worry. Um, yes, so the quick editor is faster for reorganizing pages. It's just a little quick edit on your see all pages section. And uh, yeah, OK. We're fine. Yeah, <laughs> we're going really quickly. So. This is, oh yeah, this is just the quick editor. So when you click quick edit, this is, these are the options that you're going to get pop up. You're going to have the publish date, the title, the slug, publish versus draft mode. Um, just to show you how there are some things that you can change right from, that, um, right from that section of seeing all your pages or posts as opposed to actually having to go into the individual edit post or edit page. Um, and also, uh, this way you can see the, the hierarchy if you actually care about the URLs. One of the things I use this for a lot is I'm building, um, oops, I'm going to have to plug my, my system in. One of the things I use this for a lot is that um, I build sites for a lot of, uh, generally I build sites for other people and I'm in there in my user account so all the content being created will be attributed to me. 
which of course you don't usually want. So this, if you're making sites for a, you know, for a department or something, or you're doing it at your company, or you want someone to be a particular editor attributed to the, to the articles, you can actually go to the page listing, do a select all, and you can change the author on every single one of them. A uh, quick way to get everything changed over a different author if that's something you need to do. Um, in this quick editor, let's get back to the microphone so you can hear me here. In the quick editor, there's a select all at the top of the tab there. Actually, I'll go this way for now. There's a select all at the at the top, and I can't quite see it from here. Somewhere there should be. Yeah, there's the published. Oh, there it is. There's an author, and so you can actually change to any one of the available authors on the system. And so you could do that quick, t you just click that, it'll select every one of them. Or you could go through, if you don't want to do every one, you can go through and pick the ones you want. And you can change the author attributed to them. And that works the same way for, uh, for all of these. Um, you can change, you can bulk change things by using this. Uh, actually, sorry, that's not quite right. Um, the quick editor does you do one. What I'm thinking of for doing the bulk is actually the bulk. If you click multiple tabs, and then there's a bulk action of edit. It brings up something that's equivalent to the quick editor, which would then let you do the bulk edit and do the bulk change on the names. That's why I was sort of thinking of it as the same thing. It's not quite the same thing. All right, so like I was saying, you can do it that way, but there's a really cool, easier, better way to do it. It's the menu system. So under appearance on your uh, navigation in your dashboard, you'll see menus. So you select that. And um, just so you know, you need to have admin privileges to, to be able to do this. Kind and, of a weird quirk from yeah. the historical way of where menus were in, in, uh, in WordPress. It doesn't really make sense because it's really more of a content editor kind of thing, I would have thought. But you need full admin privileges. Mm -hmm. So now we have a way to, uh, a much easier way to do it. So. You, oh yeah, and you also need a theme that supports the menu system. Most themes do, but there are some of them that don't, so just so you know. Um, nav menus lets you build the menus that are independent of page order and hierarchy, which means that you're, you can literally drag and drop what pages or categories you'd like to have on your, on your navigation menu. However, we do recommend that the page hierarchy matches the URLs for SEO purposes, but you don't actually have to do it this way. So to create a new menu, you just, I think it says create, does yeah, it say this create is new? new? This is new 3 stuff. Yeah, so you, you, you name the menu, and then on the left-hand side is where you'll have options of what you want to put on the menu. Do you want your about page, your contact us page, you know, maybe the categories of all of those travel posts that you love so much, that kind of stuff. And then they, you just click OK, and they will, appear on the right hand side and then from there you literally can drag and drop them uh, you can even drag and drop them so for yeah so drag and drop do you have it oh and as you'll see the the third menu item is uh, a sub menu you literally just pull it in and now it's a sub menu so as you can see it's a lot easier than having to number them and figure them out that way and then all you have to do is does it say yeah or create new menu or whatever. And then, and then the other thing is, one more step is you have to tell your, your theme where you want the menu to go. Because some themes have more than one option for where the menu will be located, so a menu location. So you just have to, um, you just have to tell it where to go. And at the bottom, well, I think this is new. Yeah, case, I was just one. doing this today <laughs> for something. So you'll actually see a little box that you can check mark and say make primary, and that means it's going to be your prim primary navigation. Alternatively, pardon me, alternatively you can go to, uh, oh, I don't even think it's there. No, it's not there anymore. They've changed. They've the moved it. Yeah. yeah, there used to be a harder way to do it, but now they made it easier. They don't want to know the harder way. No, forget it. You don't need to know. So yeah, so then you can see the menu. So now it's in the order that we just placed it in before. Which and is totally nuts. But yeah. But that was the point. Is that the exact oh yeah. And so you can see, I, so you'll have to forgive me. I don't know what's up with this prescription, but that seems really far away. <laughs> so you can see that that submenu item shows up as a submenu item, depending on how your theme is going to display it. But usually it's just a little drop down like that. Sure. 
So now we're moving on to widgets. Fun to say and fun to play with? I don't know. Widgets are great. So widgets are tools, are content items that you can add, arrange, remove from any of the widgetized areas on, uh, in your theme. Um, so usually the most common place for a widget is the sidebar. And widgets can do almost anything. Uh, the default ones that usually come with WordPress uh, or with the, the WordPress themes are things like calendars or archive listings. So you could have like all of your posts listed in an archive by year. Uh, search functions, those kinds of things. Um, so here's an example on the 2013 web uh, theme where the widgets is actually in the footer. So it's a widgetized footer area. Um, so yeah. So the widget admin is under the appearance uh, menu, and this is the, the screen that you'll get. You'll see that all of your t available widgets are on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side are your, <clears throat> pardon me, available widget locations. So you literally take your widget and just drag, drop, and that's really all you need to do to make them, to at least make them show up. Oh yes, and at the very bottom is uh, a little place where if let's say you tried a widget and then you're not too sure about it, you just want to remove it, but you don't want to lose any of the settings because you, you do need to set the widgets up to actually do something, you throw them down there and then that way they are saved for you to reuse later. Yeah, so this is just an example of uh, how you would drag and drop. You just drag and you drop and you can reorder as well. So any of the widgets in a particular area, you can reorder them just like the menu. And that one was for a Twitter widget. So you see that now the Twitter widget's sitting on the sidebar. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ex exa no, that's exactly it. So just for in case not everybody heard that. Um, if you want to have a certain feature that would go in a widgetized area and it doesn't seem to be with your particular install or theme, um, that means that you need to go find a plugin, which, are we going to talk about plugins? Briefly. Yeah, we are going to talk about briefly, but basically not all plugins are widgets, but all widgets are plugins. Yes. So um, if you want something that doesn't exist, I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my, off the top of my head. Twitter, the one we just did. Yeah, so for instance, if you don't want to hard code a, tw a Twitter um, into, your, into your website, you can get a Twitter plugin. So you install the plugin, it will then, you'll have this new fancy Twitter widget in your widgets, and then that's what you're going to use to drag and drop. So if it's not in your existing widgets, it means you've got to go do a search and look for a plugin to do what you want. Yeah, so we're just going to backtrack sort of to what I was saying before at the beginning about all the available resources there are uh, to learn WordPress. So of course, WordPress.org, always sort of at the top of our list. It includes also a theme repository to get free and commercial themes, as well as a plugin repository to get plugins. Um, and the codex, which we already talked about, all of the documentation, and the support forums to get help. There's also something we didn't mention, which is WordPress TV, which um, is basically actual videos of presentations done at WordCamps all around the world that, uh, and other types of videos. So if you're more of a visual learner, you want to hear or watch a video of someone talking about a WordPress topic, you can go there, and it's totally free. So it's a great way to learn stuff about WordPress. We are intending, I would say, the best word is to video everything this weekend. But unfortunately, as we learned last year, not all the videos come out. So pick your favorite sessions you want to go to. And uh, well, we hope you can back it up with a video that you can see later for the ones you missed. We can't guarantee it, unfortunately. So we also talked about the WordPress help like we did at the beginning. It's just available on, uh, in your actual dashboard. So you can go uh, find uh, resources about WordPress link to the actual .org website so you don't need to type it in, which I always forget is there and I always type it in, um, and documentation in the codex and the support forum. So it's all there in your WordPress dashboard. So the theme repository in WordPress uh, on WordPress.org is basically, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's a repository of themes, thousands and thousands of themes that are available and they're also reviewed by 
automatic before they're released to the general public. So um, that being said, they're not the reviews aren't perfect because that would be ridiculous and nobody has that much time. But they do ensure some base standards are met so that you so that you know that the themes aren't going to, um, for instance, have malware, which is something that oh question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah, that's you that's called responsive or mobile or for mobile, but usually it's responsive these days. So if you were looking for a theme in the repository, you would want to make sure that it says it's responsive. Yeah, that that would be the keyword that you're looking for to make sure that it rescales on mobile. I don't think anyone's covering responsive per se on the weekend, but it should come know. up in the theming docs. Mm. Mm -hmm. No, the uh, he, no, he's actually talking about how blogging, to do it. Actually, doing the WordPress admin from, from your mobile, mobile phone. Device. Yeah. So, uh, also on WordPress.org is the plugin repository. Again, thousands of plugins. Uh, however, the plugins, unlike the themes, don't get expertly reviewed by Automatic. So, just be aware of that. That, that being said, there are so many people on that repository uh, downloading the plugins and things that unless you're having one of the unlucky ones who downloads a, an infected uh, plugin within the first hour or two that they're there, they're usually found by other people and taken off. So it's usually pretty safe. Mm -hmm. This is true. I think we can skip through this because we already talked about the codecs and the support forums. Just be aware that they're there on uh, WordPress.org. A key note about the support forums, though, is that um, even though they are on the official website, they are not officially monitored by Automatic or anyone from WordPress.com or WordPress.org. There, there are people from those organizations there, um, and there are people who do do it sort of as part of their time, but there really, I don't think, are anyone that are officially, officially full-time support people on the forum. It's more an ad hoc help thing pitch in, a lot of developers pitch in. Um, I answer questions on the forums, not too regularly. Usually when I answer a question, it's because I've stumbled across a question someone has that I can answer when I was looking for something else. Um, and I'll just answer it because I can. And I think a lot of people do it that way as well. Um, so when you're using the forums, the best approach is make sure that basically try to explain your problem as, as clearly as you can and be polite. And basically the more clearly you explain it and the more polite you are in explaining it, the more likely you are to get a response from somewhere, someone out there in the community who's just willing to help you. All right, so other than WordPress.org, there is other help available. Um, you can Google WordPress with some topic like WordPress, how to add a widget, WordPress, how do I change my header in this particular theme, some kind of Google search. Um, but like I said earlier, just watch the dates. They might be out of date, uh, the, the posts that you find, or the, the blog posts or tutorials that you find. Um, and and it, and then it may not work. So if you start with checking the date, you might decide, okay, it's five years old. I'm not going to try to figure use this tutorial. Um, and as a note, even the codex can be wrong at times. But I haven't seen that too many. I have. Oh, have you? Wow. I've been lucky, I guess. I don't Again, find too many the, errors. The codex is a community supported document. It's a community that's writing it. Um, so some articles can be out of date. And some articles I have found a very less commonly, but I have found one or two that are just plain wrong. Mm -hmm. So another place that you can find information is books. But like most things with technology, you know, it comes in, it comes out, and then there's new stuff. And so books sometimes seem out of date very, very quickly. Um, one good book, though, is Digging into WordPress. And it covers WordPress in depth. Um, but it's not necessarily a beginner thing. Um, and they also have a... Digging into WordPress also has a blog with a lot of information. And something that's not on this slide, but I've come across, is sometimes you can find really good eBooks about WordPress. Again, once you kind of get you, like knowing what to look for, you'll know where to find a reputable information. And also, like our meetup group uh, on Facebook, myself, uh, I'm one of the admins, and I try to post relevant stuff. So sometimes uh, we we find eBooks. You know, um, Richard found one not too long ago on security. 
you know, so there, there is up-to-date information online about WordPress. Other help, WordCamps, WordCamps. So WordCamp Central um, describes WordCamp as a conference that focuses on everything WordPress. So that's what we're doing uh, this weekend. Montreal doesn't have a date set, but it's usually June or July. Toronto's is already set at November 15th and 16th. And there are WordCamps literally all over the world. Um, they even started a WordCamp Europe last year. This year it'll be in Sofia, Bulgaria. So literally there is a WordCamp almost everywhere. Um, yeah, and the cost, because these are volunteer-run, non-for-profit events, they're usually a song. So our event's $30. Most Word, WordCamps run 20 to 40 bucks. That usually includes lunch, swag, and lots of free information. So it's basically the best bang for your buck. OK, so let's talk about plugins then quickly. Um, so for adding and managing plugins, one quick note again, if you're on WordPress.com, you can't add plugins. You can change some of the settings. You can change which ones you may actually be using on your blog or, or website, but you can't actually add any. So in the, uh, the screen, if you go into the side menu again, the, uh, the plugins menu, the first default item is the installed plugins list. And it gives you a listing of the plugins that we have available. Uh, one of the things we'll note, and it tells you in about six different places, is that we have uh, an update needed on one of our plugins. And as well along the top, there's actually a summary. Jasmine mentioned um, it related to the posts. You'll see these on posts and pages as well, where it kind of tells you the different categories of status of things you have. So that's telling you the plugins that are installed, the ones that are being used. Uh, posts and pages have a similar list on the top that tells you your drafts and which ones are published and which ones are in the trash and kind of things like that. So you'll see that throughout uh, WordPress there's a lot of common themes. So adding a new plugin. Add new on the plugins menu or on the plugins, yeah, sorry, on the sidebar plugins menu. And generally we search. Type in some keywords. I particularly typed in the actual name of the plugin I want because I happen to know what it is. That's the plugin that extends the editor, as I was mentioning. So I'm going to do the search. And this gives us search results. I've kind of cut it off to get the space on the slide here. It actually returned quite a number of, of plugins that, had, uh, that came back for that search. You'll actually see there's actually some plugins for the plugin. Um, and that's quite common that happens. People will create other plugins that add or extend the original plugin and do extra things or, or help you manage that plugin, depending if it's one of the bigger plugins. So this then uh, as well gives you on the search, um, you have a, a listing that's got some descriptions, it's got a user rating, gives you the name and some options to install or to get some more details. We're going to take a look at, uh, oh actually I changed the, uh, the order of some of these things, sorry, slide jack change here. We're going to actually do the install. Um, just click the install now button and we go through a sequence that comes up with another screen telling you it's installing. Usually this ticks through quite nicely and you'll get the, uh, the message at the bottom that's successfully installed. But it, uh, it has happened to me a, a few times that it doesn't actually work. You, you occasionally will get a, a glitch or an error and you'll have to clean up or retry. Um, so when installing, I've got a few notes in a few other pages, but when installing any new plugin, you probably really should have a backup of your site first. Make sure that if anything goes wrong, you, you don't uh, lose your whole site. You can just back up out of it. Well, I had the note on there, uh, some plugins uh, will auto-activate, but most of them you've actually got to hit the activate plugin uh, link that's there. And that will then uh, take you to the screen that tells you that the plugin's been activated. We now see the color coding here that tells us that TinyMC Advanced is actually uh, there and running. And actually, if you jump back for a second, we were asking about the Twitter stuff. That's the Twitter plugin that did the, the widget that I had up there a few slides back. And the other thing to note then when you install a plugin, not all plugins do, but a lot of them will add some sort of a settings area. And that's under the settings down towards the bottom of that side menu. And when it expands, you'll actually see there's a new entry there for TinyMC Advanced, which brings up the settings page for TinyMC Advanced, lets you configure how your editor looks. Plugin settings, just sort of summarizing that, um, should be in that settings space. 
but they're not always. I've seen plugin settings pages almost anywhere. Um, you can see them under tools, right at the top under dashboard. Uh, sometimes they're even under the, uh, like there can be anywhere, literally. Uh, they're supposed to be under settings, but not all of them do that. That's a more recent convention, although it has been the convention now for about two years, but still not every plugin's caught up to that and, and put their plugin settings where they're supposed to be. Updating plugins. Um, we had that plugin that was saying it needed to be updated. You can click on the link for updating. It's the quick way to get there. Again, back up before you do your updates. Updates can break, especially if you're doing some of the bulk ones, which I'll show you in a second. Um, doing maintenance and updates and backups and things is entirely a talk on its own. I, mean, I, I gave a couple of WordCamp presentations on backups. It's really a whole talk that you could spend half a day on sort of trying to learn how to maintain and run your whole site if, uh, if that's something you want to do. So the plugin update screen, again, a very similar screen to several that we've seen already. It's now updated, telling us everything went fine. Um, we can also use the WordPress updater, which is up in the dashboard section at the top. And you'll notice it has several sections at the current time. It's only telling us about the one plugin. But there's also a section for WordPress itself and as well for themes. Uh, if you've got a lot of updates you need to do, this can be a little faster space than do, to do it rather than doing anything individually. No, unfortunately not. Um, you, you either back up independently of WordPress uh, using other software on your hosting system, or there's plugins you can add. Uh, again, you can add, add a plugin. As, as they say, there's an expression in WordPress not quite as much used as it used to be, but there's a plugin for that. Um, there, it, there are quite, there are probably at least 20 major backup plugins you can use. Some of them are paid, some of them are free. There's some good free ones on the repository. The paid ones have slightly more features, but uh, in the case of backup, a lot of the ones on the repository are catching up to the paid ones. Several of them are actually pretty good. Uh, in other cases, there's some, just going back to the plugins, actually we'll get into it in a second. Um, so choosing good plugins, which is about where I was going to go without actually hitting the new slide. Uh, one of the things you want to start looking at when you're choosing a new plugin is the download volume. Is it being used by a lot of people? Starts telling you, I mean, it's not concrete, but it starts telling you things like, you know, is it popular? Are other people using it? If other people are using it, then it probably does the job it's supposed to be doing. It probably does it not badly. Um, also means that if you've got a plugin that's got high volume, you might, not necessarily, but you might get long-term support for it. If you've got a plugin that's got almost no volume, the plugin author may decide, eh, no one's using it. I'm not going to support it anymore. And then it may die a few versions down the road because WordPress breaks something in it because it's changed something. Um, Look for recent updates, again, an indicator of support. Not necessarily a concrete indicator, but an indicator of support. And not everything needs to be updated to run with the current version of WordPress. And you'll sometimes find some uh, plugins, especially some of the smaller ones, uh, don't really need a lot of updating, and the authors aren't always quick to get things updated to say that it's officially supporting the current release, even though it runs just fine. Uh, look at the responses in the forums. We talked about the forums already. See what the response is in the forums. Is there a community answering the forums? Is the plugin author answering the forums? Or are the, are the questions just sitting there unanswered? High ratings, again, not an indicator necessarily of everything, but you know, look for the ratings. Good compatibility ratings, there's a box for that. That one's a little less used, so it's kind of harder to go by, but it's something you can look at. So where are we going to find all this stuff? Back at the repository. The details view on the plugin search, jumping back a little bit where I searched for uh, tiny MCE, will give you a screen that gives you some of it. It's taking the information from the repository. This is kind of an abridged version of the repository. If you really want to see everything, you can take that link that every page from, from this preview has for the plugins back to the repository, and you get the full listing on the repository that has all those things I just discussed. So it's got the ratings, it's got the user information, it's got the support stats, and it's got the compatibility rating down at the bottom. Again, going back on this idea that none of this is com concrete and kind of takes a bit of experience or a gut feel on it, um, this is a plugin that I actually use, unfortunately. It's one that's not really being supported well anymore. The author gave up on the support because there was just too much demand and he wasn't getting paid for it. It was a free plugin. He said, just, I just can't hack supporting this anymore, so he isn't really supporting the plugin. Um, and so if you go and look at this, you can see that uh, you're starting to see more negative responses than positive responses down on the compatibility. 
Uh, and you can see, I can't remember on this one, yeah, well, it's only got zero of one, which isn't really a good stat, but basically the forum's not being answered either. So, you know, this may give you some ideas that, you know, hang on, maybe this isn't the greatest of plugins to use. That being said, um, this is a plugin that's right off the front page on the uh, WordPress repository. It's listed as one of the featured plugins. And it's a very popular, very widely used caching plugin. And you'll note down the bottom on it, there are complaints. So no matter how good the plugin, there will be complaints. So it is something to keep in mind. Don't discard a plugin just because there are complaints. Uh, pro one of the problems with something like WordPress is the environment of WordPress. It's a big chunk of software. There are thousands of plugins. There are thousands of themes. They don't all work together. Some of the, because again, you're dealing with authors who've written their plugins in their spare time, done it for free, done it for fun. They aren't always following the best practices. So some plugins and some themes just do not work with each other. Um, and that's not necessarily the fault of the plugin author, say, for instance, if someone's written a badly coded theme. Their plugin may be just fine, but you go and try and load it on your site and it doesn't work. Who you're going to blame? Well, people go and blame the plugin author because that's what they loaded last. They don't understand it's actually the theme that's got the problem. Uh, and that is quite a common occurrence. So don't take negative reviews necessarily as being the end of something. There's, just because there's so, especially in a higher volume plugin, there's guaranteed to be people that have had problems with it simply because they've had an incompatibility. Uh, Google Analytics is a common plugin that a lot of people use. You can just take your Google Analytics code and embed it in your, in your, uh, in your site in a lot of different ways, kind of the way Google tells you to. But there's some advantages to using one of the plugins that are available. Um, you get features like excluding traffic from the, from the counts. For instance, if you're on a low volume site, which a lot of people's small WordPress sites are, your admin traffic can actually be a lot of traffic on the site. And so you can do things with the plugins like say, hang on a second, if I'm logged in, don't put the Google code on the page so Google doesn't count it. And you, there's a lot of other nifty and far more powerful features than that, but that's one of the sort of the cooler ones. Okay, beware of unknown plugins. There are many plugins that are not on the WordPress.org repository, so that's not to say don't go off of that repository. Just make sure you know where you are. Uh, understand that there are a lot of plugins out there that have malware, and um, you know that's just going to get you in trouble. And searching on anything with WordPress with the keyword free in it will likely lead you to trouble because there's a lot of people that are capitalizing on that, unfortunately. It, it's, it would be nice if we didn't have to worry about that, but we do. Um, we'll jump to it in the themes. I don't know if it's in the slides anymore, but I can pretty much guarantee you that if you search free WordPress themes and download a few, you will get malware. Um, there's just too many out there that it, there are people, as I said, are taking advantage of that. Um, so there are many plugins that are not in the repository that are good. Uh, many of them are free, many of them are commercial, uh, and unfortunately you're just going to have to try and find out from other people using WordPress what the trusted sources are. Just trying to figure out from the community what places you can rely on getting things from that are not going to have malware. And there's an article there that was posted a while back, uh, actually almost two years ago by Security, which is a major sort of um, uh, security firm. Uh, the C so, I forgot what level. One of the C levels of that firm is actually presenting on the weekend about security. And uh, so he'd be a great person to go and see his presentation if you want to learn more about security. But they had a, a, a article that was on a plugin that uh, I'm pretty sure that was the article I've got the link for. That that plugin was available, it was a free WordPress plugin. It did absolutely nothing but put malware on your site. It didn't even do what it was advertised to do, it just had a malware pay payload in it. Um, so that's the idea of some of the, it gives you an idea of some of the trouble you can get into if you're not careful about clicking on random links uh, for things. Okay, uh, a couple of final plugin notes. Make sure you remove all the unused plugins from your site. They can be a security issue. Uh, Tim Thumb was a vulnerability. It was a plugin for doing thumbnailing, in, mostly in themes, but some of the plugins used it as well. And it had a vulnerability in it. This was two summers back. And it did not need to be active to be exploited. The code just had to be on your site and someone could exploit the vulnerability. And so you want to make sure that anything you're not using the best practices just get it off your site. It reduces the risks. 
Uh, aside from that, keep everything up to date so you get around to having things that have security issues in them. And uh, install a backup plugin and use it. Because your best friend when you have problems is to do a restore. And uh, a little note on the Tim Thumb thing, just going to remind me of another thing, is a lot of the hacks, we kind of alluded to that earlier too, a lot of this stuff is run by script bots. They're automated computers. There aren't people out there that are actually trying to run. Even your spam you get on your site, which I'll talk about later. There aren't people out there clicking on your site and entering the spam. There aren't people out there when they hack your site or whatever that have actually even looked at your site for the most part. It's all done by automated scripts and engines and things that just find your URL and hit your site. And they can figure out you have a WordPress site. They know where all the key things are in WordPress and they can just hit those places. And sort of where that summarize on that, two summers ago when that Tim Thumb vulnerability was out there, I have a monitoring program on a couple of my, uh, on my personal sites. And it tells me when uh, anyone tries to do something weird in a link. And someone, one night, I got 372 emails in the span of two minutes. And it was my monitoring programming telling, sending me an email every time someone gave me a fishy link. 372 attempts at Tim Thumb. Someone basically had a script that was just going through every known plugin that had Tim Thumb and was trying to hit that address on my site. 372 times in an order, just bang, 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 trying to hit every possible time it could have found Tim Thumb. And that gives you an idea of what people are out there doing. It's not someone out there doing it by hand. It's scripts. They're just going to do site after site after site, automatically hitting things. Okay. Um, we got themes. Did you want to do themes? Although this is all new, but it's new for me too. So yeah, it's all the new theme. Sure, we can. We can. We, we can muddle our way through. Yeah. So a theme defines the look and feel of your site. Um, it holds the key features to your site. And um, so the graphics, the colors, the widget locations, uh, column layout, those kinds of things. Um, it can be changed relatively easily. Like we looked at the theme. Uh, the three or four themes we've gone through. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it's pretty much like a quick change. We'll see it later. Yeah. Um, but beware of something called theme lock in. So sometimes a theme will have key features that are specific, uh, specific to that theme. And then when you try to change, it messes up the look of your site um, because they'll be disabled without that particular theme. And um, oh yes, just another point about the WordPress.com. You can't change the theme. You can't add a theme that you found somewhere else on WordPress.com. Um, but you can. Uh, you can pick one. Yeah, exactly. You can pick from the ones you want to use. And there is a CSS upgrade on WordPress .org, uh, on WordPress.com, but again, you got to pay for it. And what I found, if you start oh, yeah. paying for all the bells and whistles that you, you need well to, you, you might as well just do it yourself. Yeah. yeah. So this is an example of 2010, which is a popular theme that used to come with the WordPress when you install, install it. Um, it doesn't anymore, but it's still available in the repository, so technically you can still find it and use it. Uh, yeah, this oh, is just right. yeah an example on this one. 2010, I think part of it was in here too. Was it? Uh, it had a lot of widget areas. Again, we talked about the different places you can put widgets. So that's kind of showing you a bunch of different spots you can put widgets that happen to be in that theme. Mm -hmm. So this is 2011. It came after 2010, um, uh, and it uh, used to be included with WordPress installs, but it doesn't anymore. And you can see that in this instance, it's got sidebars on the right hand side on some pages. Oh, and look at that not on others. So this is 2012. We talked about it a little bit earlier. It was the one that we used actually as our demo site during this uh, presentation. It's a very popular theme and it still comes with WordPress. It's very simple, like Rick mentioned before. Has some options for background and headers, um, as do many other themes. Um, It is. Yes, 2012 is responsive. 2011, I yes. believe, was? Anyone can correct yes. me? 2011 was 2010. Was not. not. Everything since then has yeah. been. Uh, 2013 and 2014, which we showed you earlier, are as well. And, and those things, just so you know, like when you go looking for themes, either on the repository or elsewhere, you should get a description of the things that are the theme features. So if a site, or if a website is saying this theme is responsive and it gives you the opportunity to actually do a live demo, 
Just take your browser and make it smaller and watch what it does, how it changes the layout. That'll give you a good idea of what it actually does with responsive and how it will look on a tablet or a mobile phone. So you don't actually have to try the theme on your own website. You can just try it on the demo right away. See that in a second. Nice. Uh, I don't think the only thing I'm going to cover. Let's jump that to catch up on time. Sure. But basically, there's a lot of options for themes, and again, just repeating the thing that. Uh, well, especially as a developer, I'm strongly on that point of using a child theme to modify themes, uh, particularly if you use a theme off the repository because they do get updates and they'll update on you. And if you change the code of the theme, it'll get overwritten when the update happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, child theme gets you around that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the new admin pages. Right. Have you seen these? <laughs> yes, I have. Okay, so this is the section in your WP, your, your WordPress dashboard on how you can manage and add your themes. So it's under appearance um, in the main nav menu. You go to themes and uh, that's what you'll see. You'll see all of, in that right hand side, you'll see all of the uh, Themes that you've already installed in your WordPress, um, in your WordPress on your on your site, and using the custom customize option, you can change the look of your theme. So this is the, I think this is is this, this a is little new? This is yeah, little new. they've been working with this customize section in WordPress for a while, but it's got some new features that were not there before. It's, I was looking uh, at it today. Yeah, the widgets down the bottom. You can actually so yeah. The, the cool thing about this theme customizer, which has been around for a couple of versions, but they're adding more and more and more to it. And you can see that we, we tweaked the header color here, which changed the title text. Um, the, most of the new stuff's down the bottom. This is a live preview. You can actually click the links on that and look at different pages and things and see how they're coming out. It's not just a static view of your site. You can actually now, in this current version, change widgets as well which is one of the big new things it adds. So you could drag and drop different widgets around and see how they're looking and seeing what's happened. And this is a preview. It's not actually changing what's happening on your site. Which so. is very convenient. Yes, yes you can. Um, you would have to add it to your theme or to a custom theme to be able to sort of override. Because the, the, most of the widgets will come with their own CSS, potentially. Oh, some don't even come with any. They just use what the theme has. Um, so you've either got to override what the theme's done, or you'd have to override whatever came with the, with the widget. Um, some really sophisticated widgets give you spots to do it. Uh, but most don't, because most don't need that complexity. So then you're, you're back to doing something in the theme. So this is the theme admin page. So you can see the ones that are displayed are the ones you already have installed. That's why you see them. And you can, where it's circled there, you'll have an add new section. You can click on that. And then you can go add a theme. Now, right up, I don't even think I've seen this screen yet. Uh, First I saw it was today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> WordPress is changing stuff on us all the time. This didn't used to be. Uh, this didn't used to have a visual interface with all the graphics of what the themes look like, the thumbnails. It used to just be, like a list. So this is really cool. This is new. So now you can actually go through and search um, for themes. This is just the featured themes. The yeah. Tab. Oh, so it's showing you the featured ones, but then you can actually search and. Oh yeah, this is part of what Troy was talking. mentioning before. So if you're looking for a responsive site, you'll have an opportunity to tick off responsive. Um, as one, it may not be on that particular slide, but yeah. So you can choose. Uh, you can basically filter what it is that you're looking for. So responsive. Maybe you want to. Oh, question. It just means that it's going to resize depending on the device, depending on the browser window. So if you are on your computer and you make it smaller, or if you're on a mobile phone, it's going to display differently than if you're on your desktop. Not every theme will do that, no. Yeah. But more and more of them do because everybody's on mobile. So if you're building themes, if you're a theme provider, chances are that's how you're making them because otherwise people aren't going to buy them. Oh, right. So basically you can check off whatever you're looking for, you know, blue, two column, responsive, whatever, and then it's going to output the available themes in the repository. So this search is only searching 
the WordPress.org repository. But unlike having to go to WordPress.org, you can do it right from your dashboard. One of the biggest complaints that I hear from most people about the WordPress uh, repository for themes is there's too many themes. It's about the only one I commonly hear, that people find they have trouble finding what they want. Mm -hmm. So this is a keyword search, but I put in a particular one because this was based on an old slide deck we did. When I first did this slide deck two years ago, we could actually search for the theme that I'm about to come up with by entering a couple of the colors and things, and it popped up. Today it won't. So I actually had to put the name and the theme in to get it. So uh, that travel blogger was the theme that I wanted. Uh, it actually gives you the result back pretty instantly. This then is back kind of to like the plugins. You can look at some details on the theme. Although the details for themes are not as um, extensive as they are for plugins. It does give you a preview mode. So again, you're seeing a preview of the theme and what it would look like on your site. There's a bit of user ratings and some sort of more detailed description. If you go to the theme repository, unfortunately, I couldn't find a link on that details page anywhere. So I actually had to go to the repository and enter the search there again. You'll get a little more detail, much like the plugins, where again you get some user ratings, um, some support stats, there's forums and things, so you can get a little more help on the theme and finding out a little bit more about what it's about. So choosing a theme basically is a little less clear than plugins. Kind of got to look at all the same things, but it's there isn't quite as much data there. There's not quite as much information as there is for plugins, and it's a little bit tougher too because a plugin. You know, if you want a Twitter plugin, well, that's got a defined purpose. You know, I've got a Twitter plugin, and I want to add a Twitter widget. Done. You know, it, it's, it's a very defined purpose. The theme, well, do you want it to be purple, pink? Do you want green stripes? Do you want two columns, one column, five columns? Does it want to be responsive or not? It adds just too many variables to it to, to really make it that easy a choice. Um, so it, it does make the, the uh, decision a lot tougher. Other than that, it's basically look at all the same things you'd look for for plugins. Sorry? I didn't quite hear you. On, on, on dot .com, there's an additional fee to access the CSS. Yes, if you're using WordPress.com, you'd have to pay that extra fee to change the CSS beyond what's there as a default. Um, well, say, for instance, on WordPress.com, there was a theme you just loved, but its primary color was pink. You could go in and change that to, uh, well, let's you know, make it fuchsia because you hate pink. Not that that really changed it much, but I'm being uh, facetious there intentionally. But you, know, you could do it whatever you want. You could change it to blue, right? So you could go into the CSS and you could make that tweak to change that color in the theme. No, you can't get into the layout. CSS, well, to some degree, um, but it's restricted in the HTML that's underlying the theme. Depending on how the HTML is written, you can change the layout somewhat with the CSS, especially now that we've got the newer uh, responsive themes, which tend to float things around a little more anyways. Um, but in a nutshell, in a short answer, no, you can't change the layout. Yeah, that's a bit of a lie. You can. But to keep it a short, simple answer, no, you can't. It's mostly just the, the color and, and sort of how things are being displayed. Um, if you're on your own site on .org, you can go out and buy any one a number of themes or get one of the free themes. But again, you might find the perfect theme for what you want, and it's purple, and you hate purple. You could then go in and edit the theme files or make a child theme or something to override that and change the colors as you'd want. This is all using .org, yes. Yeah. And if you wanted to change the layouts on your own theme on your old th site, you could do that. But again, I'd highly recommend a child theme then, and you actually just go in and modify the, the uh, theme files and stuff, and you could actually then really fundamentally change the layouts. OK, so um, I installed this theme largely as a demo. We'll just click on the Install button. Again, it gives you that same success screen, which isn't really different than we've seen before. And that's the theme. Why did I install this theme, and why did I stick to it, even though I've read on the slide deck? Well. Not because I particularly like the theme. It was one that came up on my search two years ago that was radically different. Again, all I've done, um, once you have your theme installed, if I go back here, um, where is it? Find the right page. There we go. Nope, that's the feature themes. 
There's your theme admin page. Those are the installed themes. If I wasn't sort of redoing the install as I was giving the example there, I could actually just go over, just go over to this page, and I could actually just hit. If I hovered over it, I'd get the uh, these links coming up on the bottom, and I actually could do an, I could actually do and make it activate it, and I could actually put it on the theme. Literally, a click of the mouse, and I could change the theme that's showing on the site. And it really does change basically the the look, the feel. The whole thing about your site, you'll notice all the same widgets are there, my Twitter widget's there. Um, everything's still there content-wise. Nothing content-wise has changed. It's just changed the way it's displayed, changed the colors, changed where it's located. We now have two sidebars instead of the one. It's really just changed how it looks. Yep. You can move it to the other sidebar, yep. Yep. Yep, we'll get to widgets in a minute. Um, actually, no, didn't we do the widgets? No, we did the widgets already. When we did the widget screen, you'll saw there were a couple different buckets. And so depending on your theme, you'll have different buckets around. Um, and you just drag and drop your widgets between the different buckets depending on what theme you have. And they wind up in the different spots. I've seen themes with as many as 15, actually maybe even 20 different spots for widgets. So that's uh, not too many themes are in that space. But I have seen some. Again, this is actually a, a commercial theme that I have a license to. Um, some of the really, really sophisticated themes, and actually this is just from a set that I have, but it's one again that's kind of a little bit different. I don't think I've actually ever used it on a site. But the reason I brought this one up is that this theme doesn't actually have any of your traditional content that we were talking about on your front page. There are no posts here. There are no pages here. Um, is there even, uh, the menu is at the top. I was going to say whether the menu was there. Everything that's on this front page that you see here is actually buried in theme options. It's all options in the theme. You actually stick content in the theme in different places to get it to show up here. So a very different structure to give you a different look on the site. But it gives you an idea of some of the things you can do with different themes. Uh, the notes from themes again, basically going back to that uh, don't search for three WordPress themes. It'll guarantee to get you in trouble. And uh, many themes are not necessarily on the WordPress.org, but you got to know where to get them. A couple of the major companies that are out there, iThemes, WooThemes, StudioPress, and uh, Elegant Themes. Uh, there's a bunch more, but those are some of the more common ones. They also have a sprinkling of free themes. So if you get a free theme on one of their sites, it should be perfectly reliable. Uh, but they're mostly about uh, paid for themes. And then there's freelance themes on ThemeForest. Those are mostly done by independent theme authors. A uh, couple of years ago, you would have said, yeah, stay away. Uh, they've really made a move to change things. Uh, they've even gone so far now as to allow GPL licensing, which they didn't. I don't want to go down that rat hole because that's a whole long discussion on its own as well. Um, but it's sort of a key factor in how uh, WordPress themes are licensed. And so they, and they've also recently adopted the WordPress theme uh, guidelines. So they are, in theory, trying to make their authors meet the same coding guidelines that they that are required for a theme to be on WordPress.org. So they really are trying to shape their uh, their themes up. Uh, themes, when you go and install a theme, remember I mentioned there's compatibility problems. So new themes, new plugins, you should do backups. Or better yet, if you're making major changes to a site, set up a trial site or a development site, a place where you can experiment with things and if it breaks the site, you don't care. You just wipe it out and start again. Uh, again, we do have a workshop on Sunday that will show you how to set up local development sites so you could experiment on, on your own uh, computer instead of a live site. Uh, if you don't want to go to the, the effort of in doing a, a local install and you have some public hosting somewhere, set up a new copy of WordPress on a subdomain. You know, just make another second site somewhere. Okay. Um, I think this is all my content, so I'm going to buzz through it. Does that make sense? Uh, maintenance is basically trying to keep your WordPress site up to date. Uh, WordPress plugins, themes. They all get updates. Everything has bug updates. Everything has feature updates. You want to keep them up to date and get everything there so that your website is running as effectively as it can. Um, a lot of people sort of think, you know, why would anyone hack my site? Well, again, it's back to they're doing it with bots. They're not necessarily out there. Most hacked sites, someone never actually even saw your site. A bot did it somewhere. Um, and then the other point is that a lot of sites are hacked not because they want to deface your site. Yeah, that still happens, and the odd site gets defaced because they maliciously wanted to deface it just for kicks. But mostly because they want the server space. 
And the first you're going to know if you're hacking is not your site being defaced, but your hosting company calling you and telling you you've used up all your resources and they've shut your site down. And that's because someone's sitting there behind your site actually running thousands of emails through and, and doing downloads of various malicious uh, pieces of software because they've stored it on your site and they're linking everybody else to it. Um, so that's why your site, even though it's a small mom and pop thing or your own personal blog, still may get hacked. Don't sort of push this to the side. Any site can get hacked. A uh, couple of, uh, last couple slides here, good, we managed to kind of catch up. These are real life spam examples either from my sites or for client sites that I have. And part of what you're going to have to do when you have your own website, and I've thrown you in here because these can really catch people, and I know some of my clients are caught by these, is that you have to sort of start to learn to read between the lines and look at these carefully and figure out why they're not legitimate. And there's a lot of reasons people would want to make comments on your site, and we'll sort of go through some of those in a second. This is actually um, a comment spam, as I call it. Someone's made a comment to a site. Again, just turning off or hiding the, con hiding the comment form is not good enough. You really need to turn it off and turn off the comments enabled buttons on all your posts if you don't actually want comments. Um, if they're at all enabled, the bots will find them. They know where to send the posts to and find the posting forms. This one, as far as I can tell, is targeted at the site owner and isn't necessarily meant to be public. And it's telling you the SEO on your site sucks and you should use their services. Um, so I don't think most people would actually make that public unless they automatically publicize comments. But you might get caught by it thinking that, hey, maybe I should do something about the SEO on my site. This is what I call link spam. SEO, one of the SEO factors used to be, not so much anymore, but used to be counting the links to your site. So they used to have what people call link farms. People would literally go out there and create just pages that were just links and links and links and links that Google would find them linking to the site, so you'd be paid to do this. Another way of getting inbound links is to have someone go out or bots go out to every site they can find and make a comment that contains the link. Or just has the link in the name or the reference because often you leave a website or a URL or your email and stuff. So there's a lot of ways you can get a link in a comment. So this is what I call link spam. And looking at these ones, it's often very subtle. We start looking for things like the bad spelling, although of course some people's legitimate comments have bad spellings. So that's not necessarily a key point, but it's a common one. Um, one of the interesting things about all these uh, comments in, in common is that they don't actually say anything about the site. Read them carefully. They pump you up. Hey, loved your site. It was great. I'm going to book your site. It's fantastic. I'm coming back. Lots of valuable information here. Common sort of comments here, and similar to the comments here. Does it actually say anything about the site? No. So it's a comment you can post on absolutely any site, and it'll apply. Again, going back to the idea that no one's actually reading your site, it's bots doing this. And so they need comments that look legitimate on a site, even though they have no idea what your site's about. So these are all link spam. They're all just trying to get your link on the site. Um, this one's a little less common, but still out there. Uh, spam email about, and this was actually an email then, but again, your email address is public. Once you have domains registered and stuff, your email addresses start leaking or you've got a content f uh, forum on your website, you're going to start getting spam emails. Um, I love this one because it's not even true. Right? They're telling you that you know, a lot of websites aren't usable on mobile. Well, actually, a lot of websites were, even if they weren't mobile enabled. Um, yeah, they may not have worked the best or may have been cumbersome to get around or whatever, but they would work. Saying they're not working just isn't truthful. Um, the other one I loved in there was the comment about you know, fixing things for profits. The only one's profits that's going to fix is the person who sent this email. And that's it. So we managed to catch up, and we actually have some time for uh, comments and questions, if you wish. And again, the slides were not posted. I'm going to try to get them up tonight or the latest tomorrow morning, but they will be up at that link. Go ahead. Yes, there's a whole page called Sessions. It's got a full description. There's something wrong with the display if you're not seeing a, it's You're on sessions? OK. There's a full text description that the authors of each, of each session have given. There's a 
a solid paragraph, maybe two or three, depending on what the author wrote. And schedule. Um, there's a schedule up there under the links now, too, which is a condensed schedule with just the titles as well. That's all up there. Yes, because the titles are somewhat cryptic. So don't. Uh, some of the titles are clear. Some of the titles have got plays on words. So please do make sure you read the descriptions. Uh, don't just judge it based on the title. Uh, sometimes you might not get exactly what you're expecting. Another thing I wanted to mention, and then I'll take a few more questions, is uh, we mentioned briefly the happiness bar. Uh, basically that, although we're a little understaffed right now, but we're trying to get it up and, and fully staffed, is the plan is to have a bunch of people, a lot of the speakers and a lot of local WordPress developers and experts who will be at a bunch of, there's a little alcove that's near the registration tables downstairs, and we'll have people there who can answer questions on WordPress, help you with your WordPress site. I know it's something I've personally done in the past in Montreal and Toronto. I know it's a lot of fun when I'm on that side answering people's questions and solving the problems. And it's a great way to get some more sort of one-on-one -on -one help or if you have some questions you don't want to bring up in a session necessarily. So, all right, questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. I do. Yes, I, do. I mean, it, well, most, yeah, most yeah. business sites, like a lot of business sites these days, well, they're starting to incorporate blogs, but a lot of business sites are largely static. So yeah, you can use it. I mean, it, it makes the admin of the content really easy, and you don't have to go through all the design work and stuff. Like, you just grab a theme. Like, if you, if you can find, you know, if you can find a theme that's appropriate, you grab a theme, add your content, and you've got a site. You don't have to do anything. Any more questions? We answered everything. That's unbelievable. <laughs> that or everybody's completely stumped or it's too late. All right, well, if there are no more questions, that'll be it for this evening. We'll see you on the weekend and on Saturday and Sunday, bright and early. Thank you. And hopefully we'll answer all the rest of the questions you have there. Oh, hey.